to the subcommittee uh, hearing to order. Uh, and um, yeah. again, just want to uh, begin by uh, saying, noting the fact that this is actually the first official proceeding of the House Armed Services Committee since early March. Um, and uh, it's, uh, again, already we know we've got good participation from the subcommittee to uh, join us here today. Uh, and obviously we have uh, great witnesses here uh, this morning. I want to just, first of all, though, begin by thanking the staff for really uh, doing great work in terms of uh, uncharted waters, um, to use a good sea power uh, uh, metaphor, that, um, you know, again, we've set up what I think is a very workable uh, process today to make sure that um, uh, we can conduct this proceeding in accordance with the new rules that were adopted on May 15th that, uh, again, allow the subcommittees to, again, uh, officially act uh, using uh, technology for some members and obviously uh, affording others the opportunity to be here um, in person. Uh, again, just sort of a, a little bit of housekeeping, um, and then I'm going to make a brief opening statement, yield to my uh, great colleague, the ranking member, Mr. Whitman, to uh, weigh in, and then we'll have the, the uh, members or the witnesses begin with their statements. Uh, again, just uh, as is obvious, uh, we have numerous members of the subcommittee participating remotely today. Members participating remotely are reminded to keep themselves on mute until they are recognized to speak. In addition, remote members are reminded that once they do start speaking, there is a slight delay in the camera feed switching its focus to you. As a result, please include a brief, a brief preamble of some kind before you start into your questions to the witnesses, which is, uh, I know most members of Congress are very good at uh, those preambles, so that shouldn't be, I think, a, a problem at all. Uh, again, I'd like to remind all members this is the first time the committee has done such an event, and I ask for your patience uh, as we do our best to make it work. If necessary, I will briefly go into recess to address any significant uh, technical issues, but I don't anticipate that today, again, because I think the staff has just done such a great job. Uh, one other reminder is that um, People really need to keep, the members need to keep their videos on uh, during this just to, again, make sure that, um, uh, you know, we, we keep a, a head count in terms of who's uh, participating. That is apparently, I think, part of the, the regulations which the House uh, Rules uh, Committee issued. I would note, uh, again, we've got great witnesses and great content to discuss today. Uh, there also, I think, is another uh, layer of significance to this um, pursuant to the House rule that was adopted on May 15th, uh, again, in order for um, committees to move towards markup, they actually have to conduct two official proceedings uh, before uh, that can happen. Uh, and again, the plan right now for armed services is that this morning's uh, subcommittee hearing will constitute one of those two uh, required events. Uh, again, it, it's uh, Mr. Smith's uh, plan to have a full committee uh, event is coming up shortly, which again will satisfy that additional uh, procedural requirement, and then we can move into to full markup of NDAA, which, uh, again, we've lost some time uh, because of COVID. And, um, uh, but again, I, I, I would just note, and I know Rob uh, can attest to this, is that the subcommittee staff, uh, not just on CPOWER, but all the subcommittees have been working hard since March, uh, so that, uh, again, I think a lot of the marks are really pretty much uh, on the runway, ready to go. Um, uh, again, the minute we uh, get clearance in terms of both process and timing to move forward on the, on the mark. And, and at this point, the tentative schedule will be that uh, the subcommittees will have a pre-mark and mark uh, probably uh, you know, late June. Uh, and, and again, the plan is to have a full committee mark uh, the first couple days uh, of July with uh, floor action uh, sometime uh, later in the month of July, which again, will keep us reasonably on track in terms of trying to get an NDAA done, uh, certainly before uh, October, which is always the ideal uh, situation. So again, today's um, uh, hearing is uh, the future force structure requirements for uh, the United States Navy. Uh, again, we're sort of resuming a conversation which started uh, back in February when the uh, president's budget uh, was submitted. We did have uh, some input from uh, Pentagon leadership, um, Navy leadership, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, as well as uh, a subcommittee hearing with uh, some of the assistant secretaries. Uh, Mr. Gertz uh, came over along with some of his uh, colleagues uh, to talk about the budget. Again, there was uh, definitely a number of issues which uh, I think our subcommittee had uh, concern about regarding the Navy's uh, budget submission. Uh, again, we have been um, operating right now on a force structure assessment that goes back to 2016. 
Um, you know, uh, the world doesn't stand still. Uh, issues are changing. Uh, you know, I think a lot of ideas about, um, you know, whether or not that force structure assessment need to be revisited, um, you know, was certainly something that was a big topic of discussion. Really going back into 2019, we had been promised uh, by the Department of the Navy uh, an, an updated force structure assessment uh, late in 2019, then early in 2020, then a little later in, in 2020, and now, uh, again, we to this day still have not received an updated force structure assessment. In addition, we did not get a 30-year shipbuilding plan, which is required by law. And I know some of the uh, testimony this morning will will get into that. So, uh, again, as we approach the the mark for 2021, I mean, the committee is going to use its good judgment. Again, we've got you know experienced members that have been through a number of these. Um, situations in the past, uh, but again, it really, I think, emphasizes the importance of this morning's hearing to get really good input from great witnesses uh, about really what um, we should be keeping focused on as, again, we uh, uh, move forward with the 2021 mark. I mean, I think the one issue that I think a lot of us on this subcommittee know full well is that um, when you talk about Navy um, budget decisions, it's a long game. And you really cannot sort of allow a, a pause button to get hit from one year to the next because, frankly, it carries a, a, a legacy and a hangover um, that is really just going to, you know, basically haunt uh, future Congresses and future naval um, leaders. Um, so, again, uh, as I said, we've got certainly a lot to talk about here this morning. We have three great witnesses, starting off with uh, Admiral uh, Gary Ruffhead, uh, former CNO, back in the 2008 to 11 or 12 time period. Um, again, distinguished record in the Navy, had six commands of different um, ships during that time period. Uh, again, worked in the Atlantic, worked in the Pacific, worked on the Hill, you know, headed up the Naval Academy. Again, um, you know, somebody whose background, uh, again, just uh, is really very strong and very solid. And um, again, his testimony today, I think, will be uh, very helpful in terms of uh, the issue that we're discussing here uh, this morning. Brian Clark, who, uh, again, has been a frequent witness over the years, uh, again, also served in the, in the Navy as a submariner. Um, the, um, uh, again, has worked with different uh, think tanks and policy groups here in Washington, is now a senior fellow at the Hudson uh, Institute. Uh, and again, I think um, one of the comments in his testimony that the Navy is arguably facing a once in a century combination of challenges and opportunities as it embarks on a new family of ships kind of summarizes really how critical um, you know, the, the, the topic is today as well as the mark that we're about to proceed on. And finally, we also have uh, Ron O'Rourke, who's a specialist in naval affairs for the Congressional Research Service. Uh, again, he has someone who has been working at that job since 1984. His wealth of knowledge and um, experience in terms of uh, uh, what he brings to this topic is uh, really almost unmatched, in my opinion. And um, uh, again, his um, historical uh, institutional memory in terms of, uh, you know, the issues of force structure uh, going back again to, to different uh, times in our country's history um, is just invaluable. And um, uh, again, I just uh, think uh, all of us should be very, very grateful for the work that he does at the Congressional Research Service, not just on this subcommittee, but the Congress uh, as a whole. So again, we've got a great lineup of witnesses. And, uh, and I know we've got members who are itching to ask questions. I'm going to yield now to the ranking member, Mr. Whitman, to, to weigh in uh, again and, and help kick things off this morning. Well, I want to thank uh, Chairman Courtney for yielding, and I want to thank our witnesses for participating today. Our witnesses are esteemed naval theorists whose years of blood and sweat to support our naval forces should be particularly insightful as we review our maritime force structure. Naval shipbuilding is a long game with some ships taking over eight years to construct and billions of dollars in investments, it's important that we be able to translate the national defense strategy into a coherent shipbuilding plan. I look forward to our witnesses' thoughts on how they best propose to better allocate resources to accomplish our defense vision. In my estimation, there are three particular issues that I hope to address today, which include our undersea strike capabilities, unmanned technologies, and our support naval instruments. As to undersea strike, I continue to believe that our nation rightfully relies on the silence of the sea to mask our strategic undersea, undersea strike capabilities. 
I support our latest force structure assessment that highlights the diminishing resources of our attack submarines and advocates for a significant increase in this area. I read an article earlier this week that seemed to indicate the department's support to accelerate unmanned underwater capabilities to replace the diminishing undersea strike capability. While unmanned underwater vehicles are essential to augment the attack submarines, I'm not convinced that they are currently able to replace the manned force structure. Additionally, I was disappointed that the budget request that sacrificed an attack submarine and believe it essential that Congress reverse the perilous decline of our attack submarines. As to unmanned capabilities, I'm particularly concerned that these nation products are being billed as being capable of replacing strike capabilities. There are a multitude of issues associated with the development of unmanned vehicles. Concerns with their reliability, their ability to operate in comms denied environments, their ability to sustain operations, and their ability to strike using the law of war are all points to a developing capability, not one that is mature. And I don't believe that they are a product that's currently ready to enter into the fleet. We need to develop baseline requirements and rapidly adapt commercial capabilities, but we should painstakingly review the application of these assets to ensure their sufficiency during times of war. I also want to take a moment to highlight the many instruments of naval force structure that are essential to our nation's success. Many of these capabilities are not immediately apparent, but are fundamental to projecting power. For example, while many of our citizens believe the United States Coast Guard is constrained to our nation's coastline, the reality is that this committee supports these forces and our daily diplomats uh, provide it to a wide variety of host nations who yearn to be better aligned with our United States ideals. We support a 60-ship maritime security program that are daily integrators of our logistics train. We support all of our oceanic cable repair capability to ensure continuity of international communications on whose backbone rides over 99% of international data. And we support increased tanker capacity in which last year this subcommittee took the first step towards supporting the diminishing international tanker fleet who will be essential to allowing our naval forces to operate in a disaggregated manner. My point in highlighting the softer instruments of naval power is to ensure that all of these elements are adequately integrated into a cohesive naval strategy. It is not simply enough for us to count our Navy ships and assess critical weaknesses. It is paramount to develop all of our naval capabilities and align them in a common purpose. In conclusion, I remain concerned that our emphasis on naval force structure highlights some of our strategic weaknesses. The integration of commercial sector practices and other maritime instruments are essential to projecting power. We need to be diligent in reviewing the real opportunities of de developing capabilities. We need to be brave and lay out a coherent naval force structure that integrates the Navy, the Marines, the Coast Guard, and the Merchant Marine into one battle force capable of dissuading aggression. We emphasize joint operations with our partners around the world. It's time for us to, to emphasize the integration, the full integration of the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, and the Merchant Marine. If we fail to do so, our nation will look wantingly on our inaction during this critical time. And again, I appreciate Chairman Courtney for having this important hearing, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. And uh, again, before we tar start with the uh, uh, witnesses, again, just a um, gentle reminder to my colleagues to, uh, under the House rules, you need to keep your video feed on. Most of, it looks like a bunch of you are, but uh, apparently the staff said a couple are still not. Um, again, if somebody has to take a phone call or do something and, and leave, uh, again, you can just uh, turn it off and then come back. Um, but uh, again, please uh, remember to please keep the video feed uh, on. And with that, uh, now uh, it's my pleasure to, to recognize the witnesses. We'll start off with uh, Admiral Ruffhead and go right across the room. Thank you very much. Could you use Mike? Yeah. For uh, the members of this subcommittee to discuss the future force structure requirements for the United States Navy. It really is a pleasure for me to be here uh, with the other witnesses who I have long held in very, very high regard uh, for their knowledge and their experience on this particular matter. 
Um, I'd ask that my full statement be entered into the record, but I do want to touch on a couple of quick points. As both of you have mentioned, getting future force structure uh, right is really hard, and it does take a long time. Um, the uncertainties of rapid technological change, predicting what the geopolitical, military, and geoeconomic environment is going to be adds to that difficulty. Uh, assessing global naval trends and then deciding on should the force be large enough for presence, which is now best defined, I think, by this idea of gray zone competition, of where you have to be there in some way to influence events, or is it about combat? I do believe that there is too little dis discussion on the effect of combat losses on major capital assets. We've been free of that burden for a long time. But in peer competition, I'm not sure that one can assume that we are going to have an immaculate war. Um, there's also, in my mind, been an overfixation on the total number of ships as opposed to the nuanced numbers of specific types of ships that support uh, viable operational plans. There's also the need to understand just how small our allied navies have become. Um, and in the past, we have always looked to our allies to support us, but those navies are extraordinarily small. And then, as uh, Mr. Whitman mentioned, the, the supplying of naval forces at sea is a challenge, and particularly the ability for us to provide rapid sea lift to support combat operations is uh, woefully uh, inadequate. I think in the future there's going to be reluctance uh, for this country to commit ground troops on foreign soil, and there will be reluctance for uh, other countries to accept those ground troops. Uh, China is going to continue its rise as a maritime power and as a naval power, and I think it's important to make that distinction, uh, that their maritime industry, whether it's shipbuilding, uh, uh, shipping lines, port networks around the world, uh, that is going to continue apace. Uh, the probability of Taiwan becoming a military flashpoint, uh, I think, will increase. Uh, I, but I also believe, as has been said, that submarines in the undersea domain are our winning hand, and we have to preserve that. But our adversaries are going to look at ways to diminish our undersea uh, capabilities. Uh, I do not believe that there's going to be a significant increase in allied naval force structure, um, and the reliance that we will have on U.S. flag shipping is not going to diminish. The, the new technologies that are so promising, uh, I think that we are often overly optimistic in how quickly they will arrive, and in that optimism, we do not plan for gap-filling capabilities that allow us uh, to be prepared and be ready uh, should our forces be called into action. Accordingly, I think there should be a high-low mix uh, of surface ships, uh, and I would say that the high end will operate more in the Western Pacific, uh, dealing with China, and that in the Middle East, which we will not be free of uh, because of the geoeconomic importance of that region, is best addressed by a low high mix. The Atlantic will require significant anti-submarine warfare capability because I think that the Russians are going to be active with their submarine fleet in the Atlantic. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, submarines, very important, but the dip that takes place in submarine force structure numbers uh, later in this decade, I think is dangerously, dangerously low. Uh, the guideline of four ships to make one in a particular area of operations, I think, will remain valid, and that doesn't make any difference if it's manned or unmanned. Um, and that is a, a rule of thumb that I think needs to be uh, adhered to. Logistics will continue to matter greatly. I've already talked about our sea lift the Ready Reserve Force, now is, in my mind, is a tremendous opportunity to take advantage of the depressed shipping industry uh, and be able to acquire some of those older, what I would call older new ships or new older ships, uh, even if they are foreign built, to be able to close that gap. And now is a time where I think some good uh, uh, deals can be made. 
I firmly believe that unmanned uh, is in our future, but we have to be more aggressive, we have to be more risk tolerant, and I'm pleased that the committee uh, shares the view of really having to focus on unmanned capability. We have had too many years go by without uh, aggressively pursuing that. Invariably, your committee is going to have to deal with the issue of aircraft carriers. And, and in this world where we will be less likely to put our uh, young men and women on the ground in a foreign land, other countries less willing to accept them, I do believe that those sovereign American airfields are important, are versatile, and that they can move power in and out of areas faster than any other military service in the world. Um, the last point I would like to make is that all of what we talk about with naval force structure is only made possible by the maritime industry that supports it, uh, whether it is shipbuilders, the suppliers to those shipbuilders, uh, those that manufacture aircraft, the technology that goes into unmanned systems, uh, the seafarer that sails on our sea lift ships, uh, all of that is in a very, very fragile condition. And that is an area that even though we can talk about the physical things, we really need to look at human capital. How do we incentivize it? How do we make it attractive for individuals to want to pursue careers in that area and also for companies to want to make investments? I don't minimize the challenges that you have, the, uh, the budget challenges uh, that are before you that will only worsen in my mind in the coming years. But uh, America as a maritime nation with our interests around the globe, we need to focus on force structure and I thank the committee for the opportunity to share my thoughts. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, Mr. Clark. Uh, Chairman Courtney, Ranking Member Whitman, and distinguished members of the committee, uh, thank you for inviting me here today to talk about the Navy's future force structure requirements. Uh, it's an honor to be here with Admiral Ruffhead and with Mr. O'Rourke, uh, two gentlemen that I've worked either for or with over the years and I have great respect for, so thank you. Uh, the Navy, as you noted, is, is at a crossroads. Uh, right now, uh, 20 years after the uh, drive for transformation led to us starting a series of programs like the Ford-class carrier, Zumwalt destroyer, and littoral combat ship that had problems over their life cycle, difficulties with technology insertion, uh, and continue to be costly uh, endeavors. We're now embarking on a new family of ships in almost every vessel class of the Navy. Uh, and as you noted, uh, we are facing this kind of once-in-a-century combination of challenges and opportunities. Uh, we've got a, a set of rising peer competitors, uh, certainly in China, uh, facing the United States, uh, fiscal constraints that are likely to constrain the ability of the U.S. to develop uh, better versions of today's fleet. Uh, there's a, uh, a you know, a uh, challenge with regard to the uh, uh, viability of our primary capital ship, similar to what we had back in the interwar period. Uh, and then the last thing is we've got new technologies that are potentially going to disrupt both our force designs and those of our potential adversaries. So the Navy needs to address a, to, to come up with a new force design to uh, address this new period. Um, that new force design um, needs to be guided by a theory of victory or an operational concept under which the Navy is going to be able to contribute to kinds of operations it's going to need to do in support of the national defense strategy. Uh, we don't really have that clear theory of victory or operational concept today. There's a lot of really good work going on inside the Department of Defense to develop joint warfighting concepts, distributed maritime operations, littoral operations in a, in a contested environment. Those concepts are all driving in a, in a good direction to try to come up with a new way of fighting that doesn't involve st strictly uh, attrition-based warfare, which is sort of the approach we took largely after the Cold War ended. Um, they are driving us toward what is essentially a return to maneuver warfare or decision-centric warfare, where we plan on using our forces to create dilemmas for adversaries that prevent them from being successful more than us being able to project power and take over locations of our own choosing. So this decision-centric move in warfare is going to require us to have a fleet design that reflects some new characteristics, different than the characteristics of our previous fleet. So defensive capacity in each ship and each co combination of ships that's able to prevent an adversary from executing a rapid and successful attack on them while they're deployed in theater. 
uh, offensive weapons capacity that allows them to actually fight back and deliver strikes and, and attacks against the enemy uh, and create a threat that the enemy has to respect, but distributed in such a manner that the enemy can't take them out uh, with a l single large salvo uh, attack of their own. Uh, diversity uh, for force structure at various scales so that we can have options to conduct uh, countermeasures to gray zone operations being done by our adversaries like China and Russia. Today, uh, we have a limited set of options. Uh, we can only put, send in large force structure elements to deal with a gray zone uh, altercation. Uh, I think the most recent example of China and Malaysia, where we sent an LCS to intervene on the behalf of the United States, was a really good example of the kind of smaller scale forces we need to have that we don't really have in large numbers in today's fleet. So um, those options need to be afforded by having a greater diversity of force packages. And then also complexity. The, if our goal in fighting is going to be to try to create dilemmas for an adversary, we can't do that using a small number of very large, expensive capital ships. We need to have a greater diversity and rebalancing of the force to create a more complex picture for an adversary to deal with that might force them to either be dissuaded for from uh, uh, starting an act of aggression or to seek an off-ramp once that act of aggression starts. And then finally, and most importantly, we need to have a fleet that's actually affordable. So both from a perspective of buying the fleet and then owning the fleet, we need to ensure our fleet force design reflects a concern about sustainability. Uh, and that's something that today's fleet doesn't necessarily reflect uh, to the degree it probably needs to. So we have a window here where we can start making some changes in the Navy's force design to reflect these characteristics and a new way of fighting and a new theory of victory and warfare against peer adversaries that have a level technological playing field and have a home field advantage that we're going to have to contend with. Um, but that window is going to close. We're already facing fiscal challenges that are constrain our ability to evolve the fleet quickly. Uh, and we have rising uh, peer adversaries that are not going to wait uh, for us to get our act together. So they're going to take advantage of the opportunity provided by either our reticence to intervene or the COVID-19 um, uh, impact on our potential operations and those of our allies. So if we don't act towards a new force design now, uh, this may encourage adversaries like China to be more aggressive in their near abroad against our allies. The elements of this new, new fleet are, are, are Fairly straightforward, we need to think about rebalancing the fleet to incorporate a larger number of smaller platforms, as, as Admiral Ruff had said, to create this greater diversity and opportunity for more complex force structures. We need to incorporate new technologies in a real, reasonable and realistic way. As Congressman Whitman mentioned, uh, unmanned systems aren't necessarily going to be able to replace manned platforms in this future fleet right away or even ever necessarily. But they can complement it, and they can provide opportunities to increase the complexity and the, the, the uh, capability of the forces that we're deploying. We need to protect the health of the industrial base as part of this. And then we also need to think about building a stronger, as Admiral Ruff had said, logistics capability to allow a more distributed and disaggregated force to be sustained in theater. Um, th these are all possible. So we, in my written statement, I included a description of one force that might do that. Um, the math uh, that we've been working on with both the Office, Oper the Office of the Secretary of Defense and with the Navy works out. You can build a force that's got these characteristics and these elements. Um, it's just making some choices in the relatively near term that is necessary to allow it. So I hope that the Congress and the Navy are going to be able to, to drive those changes uh, and come up with a force plan that I think uh, could be more credible and uh, something that our, both the, our industry and our U.S. allies would be able to depend on. So thank you for your time. Great. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Uh, Mr. O'Rourke. Chairman Courtney, uh, Ranking Member Whitman, distinguished members of the subcommittee, Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to testify on future Navy force structure requirements. This is a topic I've worked on throughout my 36 years as a CRS specialist in Naval Affairs. And uh, I want to echo the remarks of my co-witnesses that it's an honor to appear with Brian Clark and Admiral Ruffhead at this hearing. With your permission, I would like to submit my written statement for the record and summarize it with a few brief remarks. As requested, my testimony includes a discussion of the 30-year shipbuilding plan and the next force structure assessment. The annual 30-year shipbuilding plan is intended to provide Congress with supporting information for conducting effective oversight of DOD plans for the Navy and for assessing and marking up the Navy's proposed shipbuilding budget. The 30-year plan does this by helping Congress assess a number of key issues including whether the Navy intends to procure enough ships to achieve and maintain its force level goals, whether DOD ship procurement plans are likely to be affordable within future defense budgets, and whether the Navy is making reasonable assumptions about ship procurement costs and service lives. 
It also helps Congress assess the potential industrial base implications of the Navy's intentions for ship procurement. Since the submission of the FY01 budget 20 years ago, which was the first time that a 30-year plan was required, there have been three times when DOD was legally required to submit a 30-year plan but did not do so. Two occurred during the first years of the Obama and Trump administrations when the absence of a 30-year plan was understood to reflect the need for a new administration to spend its first year reviewing and revising the previous administration's defense plans. The third occurred in FY06 when DOD provided only a brief document that included few details about projected ship procurements. If DOD does not submit an FY21 30-year plan, it would be the first time since FY06 that an administration not in its first year in office was required to submit a 30-year plan but did not do so. The delay in submitting the FY21 30-year plan raises a potential institutional issue for Congress regarding executive branch compliance with statutory requirements that are intended to support Congress's role in conducting oversight of executive branch operations and authorizing and appropriating funds. This potential institutional issue is not the only one that Congress may consider in connection with the Navy's FY21 budget. An additional one is posed by the budget's treatment of the procurement dates of the aircraft carrier CVN-81 and the amphibious ships LPD-31 and LHA-9. The Navy states that its proposed FY21 budget requests eight new ships, but that figure includes LPD-31, a ship that Congress procured in FY20. Excluding this ship, the Navy's proposed budget requests seven new ships rather than eight. That's less than the 11 ships that the Navy requested for FY20, or the 13 that Congress procured in FY20, or the 10 that the Navy projected under last year's budget that it would request for FY21. In dollar terms, the Navy for FY21 is requesting about 15 to 17 percent less funding for the shipbuilding account than it requested in FY20, or what Congress appropriated for FY20, or what last year's budget projected would be requested for FY21. The Navy states that its five-year plan includes 44 new ships, but that figure includes the amphibious ships LPD-31 and LHA-9 that Congress procured in FY20. Excluding these two ships, the five-year plan includes 42 new ships, which is 13 less than the FY20 five-year plan and 12 less than last year's budget projected for the current five-year period. Statements from Navy officials suggest that the new force structure assessment that the Navy reportedly completed months ago, called the INFSA, could shift the fleet to a more distributed architecture that includes a reduced proportion of larger ships, an increased proportion of smaller ships, and a newly created category of large unmanned vehicles. Such a change could alter the mix of ships to be procured and the distribution of shipbuilding work among the nation's shipyards. More recently, it's been reported that OSD has been reviewing the INFSA and conducting its own analysis of Navy force structure requirements and that the INFSA won't be released until OSD completes its work. Given its potentially significant changes in force level goal and fleet architecture, not having access to the INFSA could impact Congress's ability to assess and mark up the Navy's FY21 budget. The remainder of my testimony explores various factors relating to the future size of the Navy, to procurement of submarines, aircraft carriers, surface combatants, and amphibious ships, and to the process for how these ships might be built. Um, Brian Clark mentioned that this is a once in a 100 year opportunity to think about redesigning the Navy, but if you're going to do that, it may also present an opportunity to think about uh, reconsidering the ways that we build ships, and my testimony includes some remarks on that. Chairman Courtney, this concludes my statement. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I'll be pleased to respond to any questions the subcommittee may have. Great. Well, thank you to all the witnesses. Again, um, without objection, all the written testimony will be uh, submitted uh, for the record, and appreciate the summarization that each one of you did. Uh, again, we're going to try and, again, make sure everyone gets a, a crack at asking questions here. So um, I'm going to try and start by leading by example, by trying to adhere to the five-minute rule as best possible. And I'm, I know Mr. Whitman is, is similarly situated. If we have time for a second round, we'll, we'll uh, obviously accommodate that. Um, Mr. O'Rourke, again, thank you for um, 
you know, your really thorough um, breakdown in terms of uh, the institutional issue that you described, um, you know, about the, the need to get a 30-year plan. Um, just two quick follow-ups. Uh, the um, process that the 30-year plan uh, by law follows is that it's, it's, co it's submitted uh, at the same time as the budget. Uh, and then that also triggers a follow-on uh, window of uh, action by the Congressional Budget Office, which again is sort of marches in a, in a uh, you know, order so that, uh, again, we can do our job. If, again, if you could just sort of, for the record, just state what that 60-day follow-on that CBO um, mm -hmm. follows when, when the 30-year plan is triggered. Mm -hmm. The same law that requires the Department of Defense to submit the 30-year shipbuilding plan also requires CBO to then take that plan and conduct its own independent cost estimate of, of the cost of implementing the 30-year shipbuilding plan so that Congress can have that estimate to compare to the Navy's own cost estimate. And um, the CBO report that is done as a part of that law forms an important part of the annual discussion uh, over the Navy shipbuilding plan. It provides very important perspective to the Congress and is part of the way in which the 30-year shipbuilding plan and the legal requirements surrounding it support congressional oversight of the Navy's proposed shipbuilding budget. So at this point, again, there is no CBO uh, analysis because there was no 30-year plan that's been submitted. Is that correct? If the 30-year plan, as long as the 30-year plan is not submitted, the CBO does not have a firm basis from right. which to proceed to make its own report. At some point, CBO uh, may try to put together a synthetic equivalent of what they think the Navy might have done, but of right. course it would be preferable uh, for CBO, uh, if CBO had access to the actual 30-year plan to see exactly what uh, the Navy might be planning, particularly because there are changes in the 30-year plan from one year to the next, and not all of those changes can sometimes be anticipated or synthetically created. And you uh, sort of laid out a legislative history regarding the 30-year plan requirement, which goes back to the early 2000s uh, when it was enacted. Again, there actually, Congress at one point did kind of tinker or consider the possibility of waiving the 30-year plan for a, a two- or three-year period, but then actually, I think, reconsidered and reestablished, again, the annual 30-year shipbuilding plan. I mean, it's just in, the, in terms of just Congress's own bipartisan mm -hmm. Um, support for this process. Uh, again, it, it, it really has shown that it um, really wants this because it, it, it waived it for a year or two, but then decided uh, by law that we should, uh, again, reestablish that requirement. Is that correct? Uh, exactly. A few years ago, Congress amended the law to require that it be submitted uh, only once every four years in the same year that a quadrennial defense review would be submitted. Uh, but when we got into the implementation of that new situation, uh, it was actually uh, the House Armed Services Committee, among others, that found that situation unsatisfactory and, and uh, requested that the Navy submit a 30-year plan anyway, which the Navy eventually did in, in somewhat uh, truncated form, but all the data was there. And Congress, having gone through that situation, then decided to amend the law back once again, to reinstate the requirement for the plan to be submitted each year. Well, thank you for that um, perspective. And again, when Secretary Esper and, and General Milley were here, again, we, we obviously raised this issue because it was missing when the budget came over. And, uh, and again, I think that a number of us pretty forcefully um, you know, indicated this is not a feel-good law. This is this is necessary for us to make investment decisions, which uh, again uh, are a long game and and really require a longer perspective. One other, uh, just quick uh, point, and I hope you guys can see this. But again, uh, uh, Admiral Ruffhead, you mentioned how our submarine force is sort of the invisible queen on the chessboard. Mr. O'Rourke described them as the the jewel uh, in our fleet. Uh, again, we also talked about the trough that is fast approaching uh, for your benefit, because I know that's kind of fine print from where you're sitting. Again, we're at roughly about 52 attack submarines, and then you can just see as the uh, Los Angeles class um, fleet uh, gets into pretty uh, high volume retirement. Uh, the blue line shows the fact that we were going down to uh, 42 uh, by 2027 and then starts to... Uh, climb back up as the two-a-year uh, program of record for Virginia class uh, kicks in and, and, and recovers. 
the um, orange dotted line shows what the budget that came over this year would do, which was it actually worsen uh, the trough. Uh, again, Admiral, you sort of mentioned dangerous, I think was the term that you used. Uh, again, if looking at that chart, I mean, we're actually, that budget would um, really aggravate uh, that problem. Is that correct? Ab absolutely. And I think uh, to overlay a couple of the other things that I mentioned, um, the, there's no question that the demand for submarines, particularly in the Western Pacific, is going to increase. Um, so you have that factor that needs to be considered. Um, there is also little doubt in my mind that activity in the Arctic is going to intensify. And, and, and the ship of choice up there, in my view, is going to be the submarine. So in addition to this um, drastic dip that exists, I also envision significant increase in demand. And, um, and, I, and I don't want to be a prophet of doom, but I think it's important to think about combat or mission loss of submarines. Uh, in World War II, we lost 52 submarines. Very few people recognize that fact. So, you know, th those are factors that have to be accounted for and overlaid on that uh, force structure chart, in my view. Great. Well, thank you. Again, after the budget came out, the Navy did send over their unfunded priority list. And number one from Admiral Gilday uh, was to restore uh, and protect that uh, two a year program of record. So uh, obviously um, your testimony is helpful in terms of uh, guiding the subcommittee as we uh, move forward on our mark. And with that, to the ranking member, Mr. Whitman. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank our witnesses again for joining us. I'd, I'd like to go and begin to talk about our proposed unmanned surface vessels. You know, the, the FY21 budget request from the administration looks to get into serial production of unmanned surface vessels. And listen, the Navy's been experimenting with unmanned surface vessels for a number of years. Uh, but it's, it's, it's one-off experimentation. Uh, I think there are a lot of questions still left out there. Reliability, uh, operational employment, law of war applications, so my question is this uh, to the panel members, and Admiral Ruffat, I'll be, begin with you. Um, do you think the Navy's ready to enter into serial production to immediately get to that point? Are they ready to fully integrate this into the fleet? And, and what elements do you think have to be overcome in order to completely and effectively integrate unmanned surface platforms into the naval force structure and operational plans that we have right now? Uh, thank you for the question. I, I, if by uh, saying entering into serial production to start a ship class of, of unmanned surface ships, I would say no. But I really do believe that uh, there needs to be a much more aggressive push to develop some operational prototypes that can be used um, that um, that can allow us to go after what I think are, are going to be some of the challenges, just the networking of, of, of those ships, um, the security of where they may be operating. Um, but those are things that you can develop over time. So I, I, I really do believe that we have to yes. look at it and not consider some of these prototypes to be a program of record. Because once you get into that mode, you get into a very lockstep process yeah. with too much time in my mind to, to fill the gap. And, and even though your question was on uh, unmanned surface ships, I, I reflect that we flew an unmanned aircraft off of an aircraft carrier mm -hmm. in 2012. Yes. 2012, mm -hmm. that has not happened again. That's right. Eight years in my mind of a hiatus in trying to advance this new technology is not aggressive yeah. by any stretch of the imagination. So I think that there have to be provisions for the Navy to construct mm -hmm. some of these, for them to be able to deploy them even before they meet all of the operational wickets uh, so that we can learn and from that work out some of the issues that you highlighted. Very good. Mr. Clark? 
I absolutely, I agree with uh, Admiral Ruffhead that we should be thinking about fielding some prototypes on unmanned vehicles in general, and then there needs to be a space during which we do concept development and evaluation to determine what their eventual configuration should be, and then also how they might contribute to the fleet. So there always should be some gap of several years between the time you finish that prototype and field it, and then get out and get into serial production of whatever the eventual version of it might yeah. be. Um, the other thing that comes in with, with unmanned vehicles is uh, there's some challenges and opportunities that are there, particularly with the large unmanned surface vessel the Navy is proposing. Um, the challenges are uh, obviously reliability, you know, how are we going to fix it if it breaks down at sea. There's law of war considerations about can it protect itself or can it yeah. simply be herded off and boarded by uh, other players like the Chinese. Yeah. Um, and then, and then the CONOPs are questionable, like, well, if it's an unmanned vessel that's going to have to operate in concert with manned platforms because it does have this vulnerability to being boarded and taken away, mm -hmm. well, then you're, you're constraining its ability to contribute to the fleet because now it's basically just another missile magazine that's going to follow along a destroyer or a cruiser, which, which limits some of the valuable, you know, the value that it might provide given the cost. Mm -hmm. And then the opportunities that we might leave on the table are uh, the, the fact that it could, if it was manned, contribute to the fleet as another manned and combatant doing security cooperation or operating in regions where we, our larger combatants can't go uh, and give more diversity to the fleet and command opportunities for junior commanders. I mean, I think that's a, you know, something to consider. So we've been proposing that instead of this large unmanned surface vessel, the Navy instead pursue a corvette that is maybe similar sized, but is a manned platform. Uh, and the cost difference between the two is actually not that significant. But yeah, in general, we should be thinking about like the con ops when we start thinking about where the unmanned vehicle might be a, a player in sure. the future fleet architecture. No, I, I agree, and I think you all bring up great points. Another thing, too, Secretary Esper mentioned, and I think it's another concept to look at, and that is lightly manned. Right. You know, look at this as a transition, aggressively pursue this, because, uh, Admiral Ruff, as you pointed out, uh, it's, it's not the absolute number, it's the types of ships that we have as part of that number, and then their operational capability, and then total fleet integration, and as I talked about, it's integration across everybody that has a maritime presence that has to be, has to be key. Let me uh, jump into one other question and then I'll uh, make sure we get, get to our other uh, members. Uh, one of the things that really concerns me, and I know many of the other committee members too, is logistics. Uh, how do we make sure we support operations in the long term? And, and we've seen the Navy's very anemic response to recapitalizing the Ready Reserve Fleet. We've seen recently, too, the capabilities that just aren't there. We see the Coast Guard pulling uh, certifications for those ships. We see in the turbo activation some pretty startling um, lack of operational capabilities there that, that we see before us. Um, with this tepid recapitalization process that we've seen, and, and we've given permission for the Navy to do some things, they are finally starting to do it after uh, what I think are, are unacceptable delays and projected rec uh, retirements of these ships, and many of them very old. In fact, I argue uh, many of them belong in the Smithsonian. They still use steam plants. As you know, <laughs> getting a steam plant certified engineer is very difficult <laughs> these days. You know, we ought to retire them to the Smithsonian, not keep them operational. That being said, um, what do you believe are the impl impl implications of diminished surge capacity not just for the Navy, but for the total force structure, and especially when it comes to what we may see in the future and what our operational plans dictate if we're talking about all this capability and presence necessary, and more roughhead, as you said, in the Indo-Pacific area, if our adversaries see warships there, but they know that those warships are not gonna be able to be supported very long, the question is, is how capable are those warships of creating a deterrence? So I'm a rough head, I'll begin with you and then go down our panel members. So. Uh, um, that was one of the points that I made in, in my oral and in my written yes. statement yes. that we, we neglect logistics and logistics is how this country has won wars. Yes. And, um, and, and I will share an exchange I had with a Chinese admiral during the time that I was on active duty where, <coughs> excuse me, he made it very clear to me that our logistics ships were a primary target. Yeah. Because if he can take out logistics, he takes out the lifeblood of, 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 of the fighting ships, if you will. Yes. Um, the other thing that is important is that I do believe that many of the ports that we routinely rely upon, particularly out in the Western Pacific, are going to be vulnerable. 
And so how are you able to sustain that force if you can't go in? You know, we've operated in the Middle East with really uh, logistic impunity. We've been close to ports. Uh, it's been a b benign flow on the sea lanes, and, and we have to rethink that. So um, the, the distances that we're talking about in the Pacific are huge. Uh, compared to what we have been used to. And, and I think that if there's one thing that the committee really needs to pay attention to is, okay, we, we have the fighting force, how do we keep it fighting? And logistics are, it will be how you do that. Uh, to include how do you replenish at sea? Um, some of the new weapons that will be coming along. So I, I, I would highly recommend a spotlight being uh, put on, on the logistics force. Uh, there's a, a line I read many, many years ago as a young officer that logisticians are a sad, embittered race of men. And, um, and I think that's true, but they're the ones that we rely on in war. Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Clark? Uh, absolutely, I agree. And uh, the, there's problems in, in basically the two different elements of the logistics force. So there's the combat logistics force that supports those operating forces at sea um, that are deployed over, overseas. Um, there's challenges there with regard to its fit, meaning it, it may not be designed to support a more distributed Navy because it's composed of a relatively small number of relatively large logistics vessels. Mm -hmm. So we need a more distributed logistics force to support that more distributed operating Navy. And then in the sea lift force, uh, we've got the aging uh, ships that need to be recapitalized. We may need to expand the MSP, the Maritime Security yes. Program, to help fill in where those aging ships are unable to deploy. And then the, probably the most egregious part of the SELA fleet is the tanker fleet, yeah. um, where we only really have access in the U.S. government to about nine tankers of the 80 or so that we need to be able to support a large operation overseas, both Navy and the other parts of the Joint Force. So having some kind of way to access more tankers to support the Joint Force in a large overseas contingency uh, is going to be a critical element of, of, you know, kind of future policy decisions for the yeah. Congress. Mr. O'Rourke? Uh, yeah, very quickly. Um, I agree with the earlier comments that planning for these kinds of ships is always at the tail end after we figure everything else out. It's almost an afterthought. And I break things down the same way that, that Brian did in terms of the unrep ships for the battle fleet. Uh, there's been a general proposition that distributed maritime operations will require a different combination of support ships, but we've seen very little uh, about what that new combination might be other than a, f a few scattered words in last year's 30-year shipbuilding plan. And in terms of surge sea lift, um, if we are not going to recapitalize that adequately, it is going to get to uh, a much larger question about what our national strategy is. Yeah. Because those surge sea lift ships support a national strategy of intervening in the affairs of Eurasia so as to prevent the emergence of regional hegemons in one part of Eurasia or another. So if you don't do that, you're not following through on your national strategy and you're calling it into question. And very quickly, if you'll indulge me, I had like sure. 30 seconds on your earlier question about unmanned surface yes. vehicles, and you raised the many technical challenges and risks, and, and the other witnesses talked about those as well. Uh, I think uh, to add to that very quickly, I would say we need to understand better uh, what the Navy has done to show analytically that this uh, concept for distributing the Navy in this way not only makes sense, but that it's the best or most promising possible way forward. Uh, we've had an assertion that this is the way to go, but I'm not sure how much analytical underpinning uh, there has been for it. And also, as Brian mentioned, it's one thing to say you're going to do this. It's another thing to develop the operational concepts to actually figure out how you're going to operate these ships and not just be a, a topic of hand-waving, you know, and, uh, and briefing slides with electric bolts on them. Uh, and so the analytical basis and the operational concepts need to be uh, developed if they haven't already, and that needs to be shared with the Congress so that Congress can look at that and factor it into its assessment and markup of these proposed budgets. I agree. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Whitman. Uh, so now we will turn to uh, member questions. Uh, again, under the House rules, uh, again, folks who are in, uh, joining us remotely uh, are on you know parity with folks who are in the room, again, by uh, seniority. And so our first uh, member question will come from Mr. Langeman, followed by uh, next up after him will be Mr. Conaway. Very good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, can you hear me okay? Well, here you fine, Jim. Great. Uh, well, uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, first of all, let me start out, uh, Chairman Courtney, uh, graduating you for being the uh, first subcommittee uh, chair to hold a, uh, a hybrid uh, hearing. 
and uh, and given the fact that you are and I are uh, our districts abut in uh, Connecticut and, and Rhode Island, I find it no small irony that I'm the the first member to ask a uh, a question uh, virtually. Uh, so. Uh, New England and Red Sox Nation leading, leading the way once again. So um, to our witnesses, I want to thank uh, both of our, our, all three of our witnesses today, uh, Admiral Ruffhead and uh, uh, Brian Clark uh, uh, and uh, Mr. O'Rourke for uh, attending today's hearing and accommodating to the new, uh, new format uh, of these hearings. And uh, I appreciate your flexibility uh, as everyone uh, across the country is doing their part. Uh, to practice social distancing and get through this uh, this pandemic that we're dealing with right now, uh, I've got some practice uh, doing this with uh, with Brian, uh, as he recently uh, virtually interviewed me a few weeks ago, and uh, it's good to good to see you again. So um, let me begin uh, my first question with uh, Admiral Ruffhead. Uh, if the, uh, the the future defense budgets uh, remain flat, uh, which Navy programs do you believe are a, a higher priority, and uh, the, the the current CNO stated uh, that the top priority is the Columbia class program. Would you agree or disagree with that? Uh, yes, sir, I would. I think that in the world that we will be entering into, particularly with uh, conventional challenges that we'll be facing, uh, we have to ensure that we have a strong, robust, and uh, modern nuclear deterrent. And and of course, you. Uh, know full well uh, the importance of our sea-based deterrent. So I do agree that that is the number one shipbuilding priority. Thank you. Um, uh, and uh, attack submarines um, remain behind their goal of, of, uh, of, of 66. Uh, where we, we should be. Yet, uh, we face challenges with expenditure, with, with expanding uh, production. Uh, how can the Navy uh, mitigate this upcoming risk? Uh, all three of our witnesses who I would like to, to uh, chime in. Uh, in terms of the uh, mitigating the shortfall of uh, attack submarines, um, one option uh, is going to be for the, the Navy to extend the lives of existing submarines and try to get a few more uh, days or hours or, or rather uh, deployments out of them. So the Navy is making that effort right now. That's one option. Uh, another option would be to increase production of existing submarines, uh, Virginia class as they're in production. Uh, the industrial base will be challenged to do that, but I think there's a it's a worthwhile effort. Um, the Navy may need, may need to consider Consider accepting longer construction timelines, considering that the, the construction yards will be building both Virginia class Block 5 and Columbia class submarines. So uh, if more submarines were bought to add to the, the two per year, certainly they want to fill in the one that's missing from this year's budget. Uh, there would be an opportunity to do that, and it may just be a partnership between the Navy and industry to come up with an appropriate timeline for construction of those submarines. But that's an option to help fill that gap uh, that the Navy uh, could pursue. Um, Mr. Langevin, I apologize. My hearing is not what it used to be. But uh, just to amplify on what uh, Brian mentioned, I really do think that this is a place where, you, where a good hard look has to be taken at the submarine industrial base. Because in addition to in the desire to increase the build, I think it's important that the submarine industrial base be able to return submarines back into service quickly. And, and I think that if we're only looking at the base as, as building the boats, uh, we're not looking at the big picture. So um, I really do think this is one area in particular where we really need to look at um, the physical aspects of the base, but we also have to put a, a hard uh, light on the workforce and how do we attract young people to want to be part of this enterprise. Thank you. Mr. O'Rourke, did you have any comment? Uh, uh, yes, very quickly. Uh, in terms of mitigating the shortfall, um, there are various options that can be pursued. And uh, when the chart was shown earlier, it actually uh, brought back some memories of mine. I've been reporting and testifying on the projected SSN Valley since March of 95. And when I first did that, it was in this room. Uh, before I think the procurement subcommittee, uh, Duncan Hunter Sr. was the chairman of that subcommittee at the time. And to illustrate that coming shortfall, 
I stood up and presented a chart that was the same size and looked very much like the one that was presented just a few minutes ago. So there are some things that you can project that if you don't take great steps to change it, those things will come true and now it's baked into the cake. So what do we do about it now that we're in this situation? One is what uh, Brian mentioned that the Navy is already moving forward with to refuel five or as many as seven uh, existing 688s and get several years of additional service out of them. That could help fill in the back half of the valley a little bit. You can also take steps to maximize the readiness of the attack submarine force during the bottom years of the valley. Uh, whether that means uh, adjusting your maintenance schedules or just putting extra money into them, you want to make sure that if you're only going to have a minimum of like 42 submarines in the late 20s, you want to make sure that they are in the best possible condition during that period for deployment. You can also think perhaps about forward home porting an additional one or two submarines in Guam or some other forward location. Great. Hey, that, Mr. Mer uh, time has expired. So again, we'll, I'm sure this topic will continue. Uh, so thank you. And then there's building. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> and uh, I'll yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Langevin. Uh, next up is Mr. Conaway. He's followed by uh, Mr. Norcross. Well, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate that. Um, it is a bit um, surreal that we're uh, having these conversations because in the, in the light of the fact that our nation has just spent or committed to spend $3 trillion of money that was not budgeted anywhere at any point in time, was not contemplated having been spent uh, in any of these uh, projections. And so I don't think members of Congress yet have absorbed that. Uh, I don't think our nation has absorbed that. And so all of these conversations will have to be reset, I think, at some point to reflect the reality of, uh, of that spending that uh, has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with with the uh, topics of today, but uh, we can't uh, we can't ignore it, or nor I think should we ignore it uh, going forward. But with that said, at Rough Ed, uh, you mentioned that uh, a ratio of four ships to one deployed is uh, a good rule of thumb. Would you apply that to our, our carrier fleet as well? Um, yes, sir. I apply it to um, to everything. The only way that you can skew that number is as was just mentioned by forward home, home porting. Um, and quite frankly, I do not see aircraft carriers more than the one that we have forward now uh, being, being able to do that because of the complexities, the air wing, maintenance, what have you. Um, so if, in fact, you want the presence in the Middle East and the Western Pacific, um, that's a good rule to have, and, and it drives the numbers. If you don't do it, you begin to short maintenance, you begin to short training, and you begin to short the the opportunities that our people have to uh, recharge back home. So the numbers that we have now with 11 won't work. Um, and then if we went to uh, 10 or nine, then you're gonna have uh, at best two ships deployed uh, under that uh, under the stage. So thank you for that. Um, I've been around a little while and um, long enough to watch the LCS uh, come and go and come and go and the, and the issues there. Um, as we talk about all these new classes of ships and new capacities, new capabilities, everything else, are there lessons that we've learned through the exercise of, of uh, designing the LCS, to, uh, you know, perhaps being way really overly optimistic about what the capabilities would be, that variety of versatility that we thought that ship would have? Are there lessons learned through that that uh, the system can use to avoid uh, similar impacts of, uh, of all these new classes of ships that are being uh, uh, proposed? Uh, any of the panelists want to start? Um, yes, sir. From my perspective, I do believe that lessons have been learned um, with uh, the Navy shifting away from the littoral combat ship. I think that we uh, put too much uh, stock in some of the mission modules and how quickly they would come along. So I do believe that, that we are shifting back now to um, something that is a bit more certain. One of the other areas that I would just offer as a caution in, in many instances where we've talked about crewing concepts for ships so that we can get more out of them because we'll use double crews, we often short the back end of what makes um, that model work. And you know we uh, offer up our SSBN or ballistic missile submarine force as the, the poster child for how you can do blue and gold crews, but people do not often recognize the vast investment 
that was made and continues to be made into making that scheme possible. So as we look at maximizing availability of ships and if we do it with innovative crewing concepts, you have to pay for it. I, I would agree, and uh, we one of the lessons we learned was that te technology insertion needs to be done in a more realistic fashion with uh, some time period for uh, the development of the substituent technologies before you start building the ship. So getting land-based prototypes done, uh, beginning the investment to put that kind of technology onto another ship so you can evaluate it in an operational setting. So LCS incorporated a lot of new technologies into the mission modules that were not um, really fully developed or even, even partially developed before the ship actually was fielded. So getting those technologies developed in advance of the ship being pursued is, is a key element of it. And then also having this gap between between the initial fielding of prototypes and the actual serial production of the ship will be important to be able to refine the design and ensure that the ones that are built in a serial fashion actually reflect the, a design that makes sense given the CONOPS that the ship is going to pursue. Um, uh, just two points that I would add to what has already been said. The first is that the Navy moved very quickly at the outset of the LCS program to try and shorten the acquisition cycle time for that class. And some people would argue that the Navy wound up paying for that over the longer run by having to make a lot of adjustments in that program along the way. Uh, secondly, this was built not as a multi-mission ship, but as a focused mission ship that would have one primary mission at any given point, depending on what mission module is placed on the ship. And that gave it less of an ability to respond to changes in strategic, uh, in strategic circumstances. And the Navy has traditionally built multi-mission ships that can adapt to changing world circumstances. And uh, moving forward, we face a lot of uncertainty about what the international security environment could be. And that might argue in favor of uh, once again building ships that have a broader set of capabilities that would enable them to better adjust to uh, shifts and changes in the international security environment over their life cycle. Great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kennedy. Hey, uh, next up is Mr. Norcross. He was signed in. I'm not, I don't see him on the uh, video screen. I don't know if he's still with us or not. Um, Don, are you there? Uh, it doesn't appear so. Okay, so next up is uh, Mr. Moulton, uh, who uh, also, he's, I see him on the screen. So, Seth, you're up. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so, I'd like to just, uh, first of all, start with a um, a couple of just quick comments based on, uh, on on what I've heard, and thank you all very much for uh, joining joining us this morning. Uh, first of all, I couldn't agree more that this is not about the total number of ships, but about their capabilities. And from what I can tell, the Chinese see the future in unmanned vehicles, uh, surface, subsurface, aerial, and space. And in my mind, we are unquestionably moving too slowly. Um, we've got to move more quickly. And we've got to recognize that experimentation is okay. Uh, one of the things the private sector has learned in the tech age is that it's okay to fail. You just want to fail quickly so that you can learn from those failures and move on. And I think that uh, that caution is really putting our national security at risk, uh, given how long it's taken to uh, to produce and and uh, field these unmanned vehicles. One lesson I learned as a warfighter in the Marines is the need to move quickly. That it's better to move fast and, and break things uh, than, than to hold back. Uh, holding back is what gives your enemy an advantage, and I fear that's where we are. Uh, I also learned a bit in the Marines about getting to the fight, care of the U.S. Navy, and my first trip across the Pacific was in a troop ship built in 1968 that I believe is still in service, uh, carrying Marines and has a steam propulsion system, um, as Mr. Whitman uh, described. And um, you know, we only lost all power and went completely dead in the water, turning sideways to the waves uh, once in the journey. Uh, that was an interesting experience. But I imagine that part of the reason that we were building uh, steam-powered ships uh, as recently as 1968 uh, is, in fact, because there were members of Congress who said, oh, we're not quite sure about this new technology, this turbine stuff and uh, diesel engines or whatever else, and uh, and we should hold back and, and use the trusted and old uh, true. And, and, uh, and I think now we're suffering the, the consequences. So one of the people I think who's really trying to change this and trying to push us forward is the new Commandant of the Marine Corps. And uh, uh, he is asking some really tough questions and, and questioning some uh, long held assumptions about uh, the role that Marines should, uh, should play. I would love to hear from you uh, what you think about 
um, the of General Berger's comments um, and uh, his plans to divest of certain defense uh, programs to uh, make room for new ones. Uh, I'm with Mr. Conaway that we cannot avoid the reality here that we're going to have to make some tough decisions, uh, some new tough decisions based on the budget realities we face coming out of this pandemic. Um, well, thank you for the question, sir, and and, and I would um, I applaud the commandant for taking a fresh look at how the Marine Corps is going to operate, uh, more distributed, lighter. Uh, I think that is the the role of the Corps uh, in the world in, in which we're going to, to live. Uh, I would, however, say that it can't be done in isolation. We need to look at how that force will be supported. Uh, how it will be supplied, and how it will be networked into the broader uh, uh, joint force, and, and I would say starting with the, with the naval force. So I, I applaud what is being done, uh, but I think it's important to really dig into the operational concepts um, and to make sure that all pieces of, of, of determining what that force's effectiveness will be need to be examined closely. Uh, yeah, I think the um, the work that uh, the Commandant has done with his team to uh, develop the elements of a new force design for the Marine Corps is terrific. It's moving in the right direction because for a long time we've questioned the ability of the Marines to do a large-scale amphibious assault in the manner they did during the Korean War or the, or the Second World War. Uh, now, looking at that force design, as Admiral Ruff had said, we're going to have to think through the operational concepts and then what that implies for the kinds of forces we need. Um, the force structure work that we've been doing that I included in my written statement reflects some of those insights about the fact that the amphibious fleet is probably going to become larger and more diverse and have a larger number of smaller platforms that will enable moving Marines around in these island locations where they might be standing up expeditionary bases. But there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to evaluate how are Marines going to get to that fight? Are they going to be pre-positioned? Are they going to be brought in when the when the conflict starts to begin? Are they going to be moved around in a way that um, allows them to exploit their mobility? How is that going to happen? And then what's their role? Um, and I think you know the work that the Marines are doing right now to evaluate their role in the joint force is going to be really important because a small Marine force based in a place like the Philippines or the Southwest Island chain of Japan can make a difference, but that difference is going to be mostly in impeding the progress of Chinese power projection over the first island chain, rather than in denying areas of the sea to Chinese military forces in China's own backyard. So thinking through and so what is, plan what is uh, so what does small, light, and nimble in the Marine Corps mean for the United States Navy? Because I think part of General's, uh, the Commandant's concern is that a troop ship like the one I was just describing is a big target. I think that at the same time as China sees the future of unmanned vehicles, they also see our aircraft carriers as massive targets um, that they quite enjoy. So and, uh, small, make it make this one quick. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. Small, nimble, generally going to mean like a company size type force or a ship that's able to carry that company sized force, like 100 to 200 people with their equipment. That's that. That's what we're talking about. Is that kind of scale? Great. Thank you, um, Mr. Moulton. Uh, next up is um, uh, Ms. Hartzler. And she will be followed by Ms. Cheryl. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all our witnesses today. Uh, I usually like to stay within my lane uh, as far as subcommittee questions, uh, but this one is more falls under tactical air and land forces subcommittee, but I think it's also relevant to our discussion here of the overall uh, Navy future force structure. And it has to do with the discussion about the Navy's management of their strike fighter fleet. And I've raised concerns over the Navy's decision to eliminate 36 new FA-18EF Super Hornets from its fiscal year 2022 to 2025 future years defense plan. And I think this could create greater risk for combatant commanders and increases the Navy's current strike fighter shortfall in fiscal year 2021 from 49 to 58 aircraft, which amounts to about one carrier wings, air, air wings worth of aircraft. If you factor in attrition requirements, then it's actually even worse than that. I understand the Navy hopes to fix this shortfall in the 2030 timeframe with initial fielding of its next generation fighter, the FAXX, which is in the concept development stages now. And I appreciate the need to focus on development of next generation capability and understand the Navy, like all the other services, have to make hard decisions given constrained budget top lines. However, 
I think the new Super Hornets would have the most immediate impact on the inventory and fleet readiness, given that it will take almost a decade at least before the FAXX is slated to be delivered, and that's assuming this program is able to stay on schedule and be affordable. I recall the Navy took a similar approach to FA-18 procurement approach uh, about 10 years ago with aspirational goals to maintain strike fire inventory levels with planned procurement of F-35Cs. That plan was not realized, and the Navy in turn had to restart production of Super Hornets to help mitigate operational risk. And I'm wondering if we're repeating history here. So, Mr. Clark, um, you have also expressed some recent skepticism regarding the Navy's management of the strike fighter fleet. In your view, what is the consequence of paring back the production of new Super Hornets? And should we keep this production line going until we have a better understanding of the FAXX and its timeline? Uh, yes, th thank you for the question. Uh, great point um, about the strike fighter shortfall in the near term and uh, balancing that against the development of a future aircraft. Uh, I think the FAXX is going to need to be probably a derivative of an existing airplane rather than some complete new uh, clean sheet design given the fiscal constraints we're under and also give, given the uncertainty about what the future of unmanned aircraft in the air wing is going to be. Um, therefore, keeping production lines going for both of our existing strike fighters is a good idea to allow you that bo them both to be an option for this future FAXX. Very good. Um, both, you, you all know that the cost of the Navy's force structure has to take into account not only the initial cost of procurement of weapons platforms, but also the personnel, training infrastructure, sustainment costs, and logistics chain that the Navy requires for each platform. I'm growing increasingly concerned that the sustainment costs of these sophisticated weapons systems are taking up a larger percentage of the Navy's annual budget. There is certainly a necessity for revolutionary capability, but at what cost? So once again, Mr. Clark, you've studied not only the effects of current weapons platforms, but also how the Navy intends to sustain them over their life cycle. Are you concerned about what the growing sustainment cost of platforms might do to the procurement budget in future years? Yeah, uh, yes. As a matter of fact, it's already making impacts on the procurement budget. So some of the changes we saw in this year's budget, the reductions in platforms such as the F-18 uh, and submarines are both impacted by the rising operations and maintenance cost for the Navy. So a future fleet design needs to incorporate explicitly the uh, long-term uh, total ownership costs of platforms. Uh, and also we need to think about how to make each platform less expensive over its lifetime. So that needs to be incorporated into its design. If we don't start making those changes, we're we're going to continue down this road of cutting production to support the current fleet, and eventually the fleet will just shrink down to a force that's going to be much smaller than that of today, because that's what we can afford to own, given the nature of the platforms and their cost. Do you see any uh, ways that right now those sustainment costs could be reduced with the fleet that we have? Uh, there's, uh, there are some ways we could better manage the fleet and its maintenance. <clears throat> so if we better organize the schedule of ships so they can go in and get their maintenance done at the most efficient time possible uh, and avoid delays, uh, make sure we do adequate inspections to ensure we have a good work package before ships go into maintenance, those are factors that can be used to, or those are, those are ways we can drive down the cost of the subs uh, subsequent maintenance. Great. Thank All you. Right. Uh, thank you, Vicki. Thank you. Yep. Great. Uh, next up, um, uh, Ms. Cheryl was on, but I think she we may have uh, she may have gotten pulled away. So, uh, in order on the Democratic side is uh, Mr. Golden, and then he'll be followed by Mr. Byrne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman, and thanks for uh, getting this hearing pulled together. Uh, in in uh, his prepared statement, Mr. O'Rourke observed that the upcoming IFSA. Uh, could result in a once uh, in a generation change in the Navy's fleet architecture. Uh, Mr. Clark also proposed a similar revolutionary approach to the Navy in his recent Taking Back the Seas CBSA report. As you all know, any major change in naval procurement in fleet architecture requires a corresponding adaptation by the shipbuilding industrial base. This isn't a change that can occur overnight either. Shipbuilder selection and training requires long-term strategic planning and meaningful sustained congressional oversight. 
so we can ensure a robust skilled shipbuilding workforce. And the Navy's FY19 and 20 reports to Congress on the annual long-range plan for construction of naval vessels identified the shipbuilding defense industrial base as fundamental for achieving the Navy shipbuilding requirements. That seems rather obvious uh, uh, observation, or at least it should be. Uh, and it also made clear that it was a unique national security imperative that required congressional management and protection. And so I wanted to ask Admiral Roughhead, given your experience and expertise, uh, I'd appreciate hearing from you on how to achieve this transition in a manner that protects and builds our shipbuilding workforce specifically. How do we uh, go through this proposed transition in architecture without repeating the harms caused by previous boom and bust shipbuilding cycles? What types of investments do we need to see in training to achieve this change? And what obstacles do you foresee given shipbuilder demographic challenges uh, that we're struggling with right now? Um, yes, sir, and thank you for that question. I think it's one of the most important ones of what the committee has to deal with. Um, you know, the fragility of the base and the limited uh, number of, of shipbuilders and suppliers that we have to support uh, shipbuilding, I, I really do think we have to acknowledge that. And as we think about future force structure, um, I really do believe that that industry has to come in in the beginning and talk about how they can uh, adjust uh, what the impact of certain investments will or will not be on, on their future. Uh, we've not done that. I would argue that even among the shipbuilders, they're probably reluctant to come together and talk about it because of the competitive issues. But I, I, I honestly believe that we as a country don't have, we don't have the luxury to not have a more integrated approach on how we want to go forward. I would also argue that we have to be far more aggressive in uh, appealing to young people and providing the fundamentals that allow them to work in what, what some may perceive as an antiquated industry, but really when you get to it, there's a lot of high-tech stuff that's going on there. And so uh, being able to, to uh, create opportunities, particularly in the areas around the major shipbuilding centers, to, to build and encourage young people to want to go into that industry is going to be very important. Uh, thank you for that feedback, very important. Hey, it, it, you earlier talked about uh, needing a high-low mix in surface uh, uh, warships. Um, could you talk a little bit, I think when during your time as Chief of Naval Operations, you were actually uh, very much involved in uh, development of the uh, missile defense capabilities of Flight 3 DDG that we're bringing into the fleet right now, uh, the SPY-6 radar system. Uh, can you talk a little bit about where you see in the Navy's fleet architecture, the role of the Flight 3 DDG or some kind of future large surface combatant? Um, what role should they play today and in the future? Uh, yes, sir. I think that, that when I talk about the high end, these are the ships that we can put in very challenging um, uh, undersea warfare areas that can perform air defense and also increasingly missile defense that can begin to accept the defensive systems against hypersonics. Um, so that's where I see the, the higher end ships, the, the Flight 3 and then the large surface combatant uh, when we get, get there. So um, I, I think it's important that we do the high-low mix because just going back in my time, it was always frustrating to take a very high-end ballistic missile defense capable guided missile destroyer and send them down to chase Somali pirates. Um, that to me was a waste of asset uh, when you could have a smaller uh, combatant go down, less capable combatant go down and do that. And that's why I think the high-low mix is, is the only way that we can go forward. Great, thank you, um, Admiral. Thank you, uh, Jared. Um, next up is uh, Mr. Byrne, and he'll be followed by uh, Ms. Luria. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the witnesses being here today. It's been really good. Um, a lot of our discussion has been about the need for a distributed maritime presence, both for the Navy and Marine Corps. A lot of talk about smaller classes of ships. Let me ask you about two classes of ships we haven't talked about. One is the expeditionary fast transport vessel, and the other is the light amphibious warship. Would each of you comment on how important you think that is going forward for the future of both the Navy and the Marine Corps? Um, yes, sir. And, and again, I'm not 
privy to where the Marine Corps may be thinking, but you know, that's the type of ship that um, I think can be effective in the Commandant's concept of how, do you, how can you configure it to move the types of, 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 of weapon systems or sensors that you may want to put in some distributed areas. Uh, how can you move uh, large numbers of troops? Uh, I recall my first visit to uh, the LCS that was being built down in uh, Mobile. Uh, when I came, I'm very familiar with that. Place. I figured you would be, sir. <laughs> uh, when I came back, the first person I went to see was to walk down the hall and talk to the commandant of the Marine Corps, uh, because I said, you know, you can configure this ship to move a significant yeah. number of Marines over a short period. Um, yeah. And in, in archipelic areas like the Philippines or Indonesia, um, they're ideally suited for types of things like that. So I, I, I would hope that that's where the Marine Corps is thinking. I leave it to Brian. He may have more insight on that. I, I think absolutely those, both those platforms are going to be important. The light amphibious warship is going to be essential for that company size movement of forces around within uh, an archipelago like the first island chain of uh, the Philippines and Japan. Uh, also, it's going to provide the Marines the ability to distribute those forces um, coming from a larger warship. So a am larger amphibious warship can now divulge the, or di distribute those Marines over a larger area and then move them around during a period of conflict. So the light amphibious warship will be very important for that. The expeditionary fast transport um, has that role can be done by it, but it can also do a lot of other roles. And I think we have, you know, the Navy's been exploring those, the use of it for um, theater security cooperation, the use of it in counter drug, counter trafficking operations operations where its ability to act as a command post has been really important. And also it could be a, a medical uh, platform. Uh, we had the recent experience with the Comfort and Mercy being deployed to Los Angeles and New York where they weren't really fully util utilized because they're a very large ship uh, being used for a purpose that was very different than its original intent. A smaller medical ship might be able to operate in a more distributed fashion, more efficiently provide the kind of services you might need in a location like a New York that's experienced a pandemic. So I think those are applications that have not been really fully explored, but the Navy's starting to do that. Right. Brian stole a couple of my points, but what I will say is that the EPF is an example to some degree of an open architecture ship. Uh, that can be adapted to a variety of missions in the future, depending on how you fit it out on the inside, whether it's for medical care or other things. And uh, since we face some uncertainty as to the exact mix of missions that we might want to pursue in the future, uh, that is a platform that uh, can be seen as something that can be adapted to the mix of missions that eventually emerges because it is uh, a ship with a lot of open spaces on it uh, and represents an implementation of physical open architecture and ship design. Admiral, let me ask you about the, the Mr. Clark mentioned the turning some of these smaller ships like the EPF into a hospital ship. Where do you, where do you stand on that? Um, I, I really do think that we we need to rethink our hospital ship concept. As I, I used uh, Mercy very extensively in the Pacific when I was out there. It's, a, it's an extraordinary capability, but in many cases, I think it's too large. Um, I do think that um, depending on whether the Navy and, and the military is called in uh, to, to go in and work with small remote populations, I think it can be hugely important. The point that Brian made, um, you know, you, for example, in, in pandemic areas, uh, I think you could probably put in packages that have the right pressure characteristics so that you could do some isolation of patients in ways that, that would be well suited. So I, I would recommend looking at, at a range of, uh, of ships. I, I, I do, however, think mercy and comfort are really large for the missions that I envision in the future. So I would look at something smaller, and that, that's one option that I think is viable. And I thank you for your answers. I just make one observation, Mr. Chairman. I agree with Mr. Moulton. One of the things that I think we make a mistake about sometimes is, is that we don't understand that we can move faster with our technology if we put our minds to it. When it comes to the unmanned vessel, I think we need to start making our minds move a lot faster. And I think if we do that, I think we'll get the technology we need. With that, I yield back. Great. Thank you, um, Mr. Byrne. Uh, next up is uh, Ms. Loria, and she will be followed by Mr. Kelly. Well, I want to thank you again, gentlemen, for, for being here today. And um, something that we've 
talked about a lot, you mentioned it in your testimony several times, um, is that, uh, and I'll quote Admiral Roughhead, there's an overfixation on the number of ships. Um, and we've touched briefly with talking about different ship classes on the capabilities of um, ships. But something we haven't touched on is the employment of ships. Um, and Mr. Clark, I'm curious, what force generation model did you use um, in the, the analysis that you did um, specifically for your testimony today? And just on that note, I had also referenced some work that you co-authored from 2017 with CSBA, and the number, although you know we discussed the, the fallacy of just result, resting on a number, was 340 ships, and in today's testimony, you say 473. Um, so I suspect that there's significant changes between the model that you used and really what I'm getting at is the force generation model, Admiral Ruffhead's comments that it's a one to four ratio as far as deployability, and then where we've gone with the OFRP, the Optimized Fleet Response Plan, do you think that that's an effective model um, and sustainable and does it give enough deployed presence um, specifically for the investments that we're making in these ships? Uh, thank you for the question. That's a great question. The, the the difference in the numbers is in large part due to the rebalancing of the force uh, to incorporate a larger number of smaller platforms and a smaller number of larger platforms. So that increases the size of the fleet in terms of number of ships, of manned ships. Uh, and then also the force generation is an aspect of that. So we had to incorporate uh, a realistic expectation for what the OFRP can deliver, which is you know, generally at this point going to be one to four to one to five uh, ships. So that increases the number of ships you need. We also didn't try to make overly optimistic projections about forward basing of ships, which does give you some benefit in terms of the rotational cycle. But a lot of the benefit of forward basing comes from the fact you use a shorter operational cycle that gives you a higher operational tempo. So those ships get worked a lot harder while they're deployed overseas, rather than you know the, the more the more steady pace that you get back home. So doing those things drove up the number of ships because we had to think about what's a realistic expectation for how, how often a ship can deploy. Uh, and we've made some you know, assumptions in the past you know, that were probably overly optimistic. Uh, so yeah, look, going forward, we need to re-examine the OFRP and evaluate if that's really the right force generation model. If we can go to a model that maybe generates force uh, forces more quickly, a higher op tempo model, which we did advocate in that 2017 study, which is more like the model we use overseas. I think it's possible to do so, but it'll require us to have an industrial base that can support that throughput of ships for their maintenance cycles. And it'll also require flexibility and scheduling so that when a ship is ready to go into maintenance, it, it can do so rather than waiting around for a yard to open or going on deployment and getting stuff broken. Right. And so to back. touch on that, when we had testimony and um, Secretary Modley um, earlier this year um, testified that the rough number that the, sh that the Navy could you know, hope to maintain in the near future was about 310 ships as far as adequate manning, maintenance capabilities in the industrial base. Um, yet the Navy has stood by the 355 and made um, it, indications that that number is going to be higher when we see the new integrated force structure assessment. But the trajectory that they have requested especially in this year's budget, and Mr. O'Rourke correctly noted that the numbers are actually going down from what they projected, so they're not on a projector to get there. And just in the time I have left, shifting back to capabilities. Um, so in your 2017 CSBA study, you mentioned a TAKE, so a logistics ship with VLS. Right. Um, and a lot of what we do is looking at capabilities and the ability to have those capabilities um, forward and in and, and that includes the VLS and the strike capability. And, you know, I really haven't heard much about this. I've talked to the MSC commander about it, um, the past MSC commander. Um, specifically, and, and do you do any work at all in sort of more innovative thought processes of how we can um, better utilize um, some of the platforms such as the MSC ships to right. augment um, our other forces and provide more firepower forward? Um, can you comment on that? And, and yeah, absolutely. So the, the reason we wanted to have that VLS magazine equipped TAKE was to allow reloading of ships in a forward location. Um, also, theoretically, it could launch weapons from there. But most importantly, it was a way of bringing weapons forward in a ready manner that could just be pulled out and put onto a ship. So forward reloading and rearming of ships is going to be essential uh, mm -hmm. in any of these operational concepts because we can't have ships driving back to Japan or Pearl Harbor to get reloaded when their weapons usage is going to be pretty high in some of these conflicts. So using the MSC fleet more innovatively and incorporating some platforms into the MSC fleet that can move forward and provide that uh, ability to reload and rearm and repair forces in the field is going to mm -hmm. be essential right. if, if the fleet's going to be able to sustain operations. 
Well, thank you. I just think that's a concept that requires further uh, examination and knowing how the mission data is loaded in a Tomahawk missile in a right. VLS launcher. There really isn't a need to transfer it from one ship to another with the technology that we have today. It could right. be a command and control solution. Right, you can launch on remote. A right. launcher in another type of platform, and we've talked a lot about platforms that are less expensive to operate right. and less expensive to build. So I think that that's an important element in evaluating our future uh, force yeah. structure. Absolutely, and that's why we included the Corvette as well uh, right. in the fleet that we, we proposed. Well, thank, thank you. you. I think my time has expired. I yield back. Yep. Thank you, um, Ms. Laureate. Uh, next up is Mr. Kelly, and he'll be followed by Mr. Cisneros, who'll be followed by Mr. Waltz, and then Mr. Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank our witnesses for being here today. Uh, first of all, I want to echo what uh, Mr. Moulton said. Uh, I think as far as research and development and what platforms and how we use those, I think we have to execute quickly. Uh, we have to uh, accept failures and then fail quickly, like he said, and move forward. Uh, the second part of that, I'm, I'm really concerned that we're still waiting on the 30-year uh, ship plan from the Navy. I think uh, it, it is very hard uh, to execute anything and for our industrial base to be ready to produce whatever we need when there is no plan. And when there is no plan, people just wonder aimlessly because there, there's not anything out there to do. So part of it is we've got to uh, research and develop to decide what we're going to build in the future. When we do that, then we have to violently execute. And I see so often we start and stop and start and stop, and we don't allow our industrial base to build the things that we're committed to. So uh, whether we're talking about unmanned systems or hospital ships, uh, we've got what we got until we got something else. And then we, that's why we have to have this plan. Uh, I go back to my question now. Uh, Admiral Ruffhead or Mr. Clark, the Navy's pursuing advanced technologies through its Naval Power and Energy Systems Technology Development Roadmap. Among these technologies are innovative approaches to energy storage and management. Uh, could you describe why this is important now as we enter critical stages of development for future systems? Uh, where would you prioritize these efforts within the Navy's research and development portfolio? And what additional steps could the Navy take to better meet its future and future power and energy storage needs? Um, I think one of the things that, um, that we need to do, particularly in the area of, of unmanned systems, we've already talked in general about the need to accelerate efforts there, but when we get into unmanned underwater systems, um, my sense is that we're always drawn to either the weapon, the sensor, or how these unmanned systems link with one another, which is all very important, all very interested, interesting. But if we cannot sustain the underwater systems at sea for a long period of time, they really become very, very limited and become very expensive, uh, unusable assets. So in my mind, there really should be a national push on long endurance, safe underwater power if we really want to uh, capitalize on that capability. Uh, and it's not just how long they can stay out, but in many areas where it will be important for these vehicles to operate, there's gonna be high currents and you're just gonna use a lot of power. So I think that, that we, got, we have to get off this idea of what's the, the combat capability and power is the key. I often used to say that Admiral Rickover didn't transform submarines by designing a new hull he transformed that entire capability by changing the power. And I think that's where the key is in uh, unmanned. And if I could, uh, one of the things that, you know, we're frustrated with the pace of our development. But as I look at, at coming off of COVID and, and, and where countries are going to be economically, I really do believe that China is gonna be spending a lot of money on, uh, on its digital uh, future and also on its energy future. Um, they also will likely have to divert some of their shipbuilding capacity so that they don't have underemployment and probably throw that at the naval mission. And so if we think that we're on a particular trajectory and we're forecasting where an adversary may be, we better be really careful because I honestly believe that we are going to see an acceleration in digital power and uh, naval ship activity coming out of China as, as we all try to recover from our economic circumstances. 
Uh, and I concur with all that, and I would also add that power conditioning and uh, power generation are going to be really important to directed energy weapons. That'll be an essential part of surface warfare going into the future, particularly for air defense. Electronic warfare, high power microwave, lasers are all going to be an important element of future air defense concepts. Uh, so that'll be an important area of investment as well. And Mr. Chairman, my next question had to deal with directed energy, and you kind of addressed that. But we need to make sure, just uh, uh, very quickly, are you looking at uh, building ships that, that house the amount of energy taken for directed energy impacts, or are we building the future? And, and are, are we looking at old ships, and can we put these systems on there, or are we trying to build new ships that allow the capacity for these directed energy systems? And with that, I'll yield back, Mr. Um, Chairman. Right, right now, we're building ships that uh, are going to incorporate these systems, but they'll have some method of being able to, you know, condition or, or, or store the power to be able to do uh, laser operations. Uh, and then the next generation of ships are incorporating the kind of power generation capacity to allow these systems to operate continuously. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, next up is Mr. Cisneros, followed by Mr. Waltz, and then Mr. Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, appreciate uh, our guests being here today. I'm I, look, like everybody else, I believe research and development is, is very important and we need to invest in this, but I also worry that maybe we are moving too fast. Um, you know, the Secretary of the Navy told me in my office that the DDG-1000 was a failure. Uh, we've had problems with the LCS. Um, how do we strike this balance? You know, might it, it, might it have been better to build maybe a newer, better frigate than move into the LCS. So how do we strike this balance of, of really modernizing our fleet, but not getting too far ahead of ourselves to where we're, we're, we're having these mistakes like the DDG 1000? Um, one of the things I think is to uh, look at, at the ambition you have and how much technology you're trying to introduce into a new class of ship. And there is no question in my mind that our approach on the DDG-1000 was far too aggressive. Um, and and we, we reached for too much uh, with, with the DDG-1000. Uh, but I, I do think that it is, uh, it's important that we, we pursue the new technologies, that perhaps we don't set ambitions of large numbers of ships in a class uh, if, if, if our objective is introduction of technology. Uh, I can go back in the Navy's history and we have a lot of examples of one ship classes uh, where we tried something and it didn't work. We were in a far different position then uh, with our industrial base and, and, and in some cases with our budgets. But I, I think that uh, if we're pursuing new technology, Smaller classes may be the way to go, and then evolve it that way. Um. I think a key area is also looking at the operational concepts, or how, how is a new technology going to be employed in practice uh, before we uh, invest significantly in, in actually fielding that technology? So for example, with unmanned vessels, we've talked a lot about the large unmanned vessel and how that might be really challenging for the Navy to implement. But the medium unmanned surface vessel that the Navy's pursuing uh, could be something they could actually go very aggressively into because it's a small vessel, it's relatively inexpensive, it's got a limited set of missions that the Navy plans for it to do. Um, we believe that it could do more in the anti-submarine warfare realm. Uh, it can do a lot in, in sensing and in counter-sensing. So if you've got a, a good set of concepts for how the technology could be employed, it may allow you to be more aggressive in employing it uh, because you've, under, you've got the trade space kind of confined as opposed to, for example, like LCS, where we had fairly ambitious concepts that then the technology was not able to meet uh, in you know, short term. Uh, so I think that's really important as an element of this. And then the, the uh, second thing would be also when we're, when we're changing ships or we're adapting a hull type over time, as, as Armour Orf had said, we want to avoid changing all three elements of a ship at the same time, the combat system, the hull, and the propulsion system. So as we go from one ship class to our modification of a ship class to the next, maybe we modify only one of those things at a time to allow you to improve it over time. And that's what we've done with some of these previous one-off ship classes is where we change the propulsion system, where we change the combat system, but left the rest of the ship more or less intact. And that's a way to incorporate technology that's more uh, realistic or less risky. All right, I appreciate that answer. Um, the, the second question I want to ask, and, and Admiral Ruffhead, you kind of uh, alluded to this in uh, 
a little bit earlier, but uh, with China aggressively maybe making a change to more aggressively increase its shipbuilding. Uh, and it was already kind of headed on a path uh, towards a 400 ship Navy. Um, how is our naval makeup looking to meet that challenge of China? Are, are we building the right ships uh, in order to, 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 to interact with them um, in the future? I, I do believe that we are focused on the right, high, low, and then particularly submarines. In my mind, it's going to be a question of, uh, of capacity. I think that's going to be their, our greatest challenge, because when you get inside that first island chain, not only do you ha encounter significant numbers of the PLA Navy, but their Coast Guard, some ships of which are bigger than some of our largest combatants, and then you have the maritime militia. So numbers are going to be important. Uh, how you distribute the force, how you network the information, all of that is key. So I think we, we have the right uh, path, path forward. Uh, capacity is going to be an issue, and then it, rapid introduction of technology is, is going to be key. Thank you, Gil. Um, uh, Mr. Waltz, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, hear me okay? Loud and clear. All right, thank you, and and thank you for uh, for having this today. Thank you to the witnesses. Uh, I just wanted to echo my colleague's concern about the 30-year shipbuilding plan. I, I just can't imagine, as a former CEO, going to my board and asking for the amount of money uh, that the the taxpayers are producing uh, with, without a long-range plan. So just to echo those thoughts, and and very much looking forward to seeing that from uh, the Navy soon. So just. Just two quick questions. I wanted to uh, add on, um, and I'm happy to hear the conversation on power. Uh, very concerned about power and particularly our raw ingredients when it comes uh, to the battery power and storage. I think we're going to need as we're starting to project uh, the need for, for unmanned underwater systems, uh, unmanned aerial systems and others. Uh, I think worth noting for the committee that uh, right now, uh, China, Australia, Chile, and Argentina produce 90% of the world's lithium, uh, and the rest of it are in other countries besides the United States as well. We've really lost that refining capability. So what, uh, you know, I would just ask for any of the witnesses um, to, to comment on the fact that our supply chain that our naval forces uh, need to predict um, is incredibly vulnerable. I mean, need to protect, excuse me, is incredibly vulnerable. And it, it's it's a bit of a, a negative cycle that those forces are, are, are absolutely dependent, particularly the Navy of the future, uh, on the raw ingredients that the United States has lost the capability to mine, uh, manufacture, refine, and produce. Uh, and I would just uh, welcome some additional commentary there. Well, it, uh, it seems like we need we, the the government is trying to do a better job of evaluating where these supply chain vulnerabilities might be. I think the recent uh, the pandemic and certainly our trade uh, confrontation with China have both created an opportunity to better examine where our supply chain goes comes from, uh, and where we might need to shore it up by investing in a domestic source of some of those materials. So the Defense Production Act is an option for being able to do that. Uh, that that kind of research needs to be done in more aggressively going back into the research and development. Uh, chain, though. It's not just a matter of what we build today. It's also where are our vulnerabilities with regard to what we're going to be building in large numbers tomorrow, to your point. And I think just to add on to that question, how much of those vulnerabilities are being incorporated into the type of Navy that we think we have the ability to, to produce going forward? And how does that factor into that long-range planning? Well, it's likely we're Perhaps going to encounter more if of it's them. not. Right. We, it's likely we, as we go into a more dis diverse and distributed fleet uh, that's more rebalanced towards smaller platforms, we're going to have more of these technologies that rely on uh, materials and parts that come from suppliers we don't necessarily have the uh, best relationship with. But right now, we don't have a whole lot of visibility into the question of uh, foreign content in our shipbuilding programs at the component, subcomponent, uh, material, and software level. So. In, in my view, that's something we need to gain a better understanding of. And in terms of uh, certain key raw materials, um, Congressman, you mentioned lithium, but the issue of rare earths also comes into play here because they are 
uh, critical to many of the combat system um, pieces of equipment that are incorporated into our ships. Uh, thank you for that. And and I just for my colleagues uh, introduced legislation that that is uh, taking a hard look at how we can improve that here domestically and welcome their support. My follow on question is, is just to state it bluntly is um, is and, and this is adding on to my colleague, um, uh, Miss Loria, is is OFRP still a valid concept? Is it is it in real trouble? And if if it is, how do we I would just welcome uh, more of your thoughts on how we get to the maintenance issues and the industrial base issues. I know I, 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 I heard in some initial testimony that it's incorporated in your written. I'll look forward uh, to reading that, but if you could just uh, spend a few minutes on that, I would appreciate it. So the, so the, uh, the challenge with OFRP is that um, we need to be able to have ships be able to do their maintenance when they're available to do it. And that's one of the challenges with having a more flexible schedule for ships that the government's pursuing with this uh, dynamic force employment concept. So having a predictable schedule for maintain maintenance of ships does not necessarily align with a dynamic force employment concept. And so that's one of the challenges that's being encountered by OFRP right now. Um, you know, the Navy's getting better at being able to do the inspections and predictions for the maintenance so they can plan work packages better, uh, but they need to address this scheduling challenge, and then they also need to address the industrial base challenge of the industrial base that does maintenance on ships today has right-sized itself to meet the exact demand that we had maybe five or ten years ago, and as that demand changes, that industrial base needs to adapt in support of that, and that's something the Navy might need to think about investing some time or money into to, uh, developing, particularly dry docks on the East Great. Coast. Thank, thank you, Mr. Clark, and thank you, uh, Mr. Waltz. Uh, next up is Mr. Thank Gallagher. You, Mr. Chairman. Yep, um, uh, Mr. Gallagher is up next, and uh, I believe Mr. Vela has rejoined us, so he'll be up after Mr. Gallagher. Uh, the floor is yours, Mike. Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Thank you to all of our witnesses. This has been incredibly helpful. I want to follow up on, on something that was talked about earlier. I, I think, in some ways, our ability to learn lessons and move on from from LCS and DDG one thousand is the frigate itself. And, and Mr. Clark, you played a key role in CSBA's 2017 fleet architecture study that called for more than 70 frigates. Can you just talk a little bit again about why small surface combatants are so important to the future fleet? And if you see the demand for them going up or down in future years? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question, Congressman. Uh, absolutely, they're important to the future fleet. They provide you the ability to distribute the capability out over a larger number of areas and a larger number of ships. One of the challenges we're already seeing with COVID, for example, is that if you've got a fleet of a relatively small number of large ships, a challenge like a pandemic can take an entire ship out very quickly. Uh, whereas if we have a larger number of smaller ships, you're more resilient, you degrade more gracefully. Uh, it also allows you to uh, address challenges that maybe don't require that larger ship, as Admiral Ruff had said, deploying a destroyer to go do a pirate counter piracy exercise or operation is maybe not the appropriate use or best use of that platform and tends to then have this cascading effect into the challenge of their operational schedule being uh, unpredictable and difficult to allow maintenance uh, to be done in between deployment. So there's this interrelated effect between maintenance and the, the size of the fleet and its composition. So frigates are an important element of the fleet to allow you to have that more distributed uh, capability than what we have in today's uh, force. Um, and in your network fleet design, would the frigate serve as a C4I node for network unmanned platforms? Yes, so we saw the frigate is doing uh, the C4 function for unmanned systems, doing anti-submarine warfare, uh, countermine operations, uh, as well as surveillance and counter-surveillance operations. So we saw it was really, had this really important role to manage unmanned systems. Um, if I could just add, I, it, I'm pleased enough to have operated with frigates um, when we had a fairly uh, sizable class, and they really do become the workhorse. Um, as the battle force may be focused on a particular area, um, the frigate, it, it just gives you tremendous flexibility. Its size, its draft allows it to go places, and you could be confident in its own ability to protect itself and still project power. So, um, you know, and I could even go back in the days of Nelson and talk about frigates, but I won't go back that far. Uh, they're going to be <laughs> instrumental, and I think we're going to work the heck out of them. That's great. Well, Admiral Ruffett, I, I want to follow up. Uh, um, you made a comment, I believe, earlier in the hearing that subs will be the platform of choice 
in the Arctic. Can you comment on the fact that unlike the Los Angeles class improved and the Seawolf subs, our new Virginia class boats are not ice hardened, meaning their, their sails and their bows are not reinforced in, in the manner that the previous two classes of ships are. I mean, help me understand, why do we make the decision not to require full ice hardening for the Virginia class? Um, my sense is it likely came down to cost. Um, but I think I have a submariner here to my left that might want to address that. Um, but I, but I still think that the submarine in the Arctic, um, even on ice hardened is still going to be a significant player. And I firmly believe that we're going to see the environment change up there quite a bit during the course of the submarine's lifetime. And I think that, that their flexibility will increase because the environment's going to change. Uh, just very quickly. And then, please. Yeah, just very quickly, uh, I think the answer is cost. Um, the 688s, when they were originally designed, were not ice hardened. Ice hardening was incorporated into the 688 class with the San Juan, the 751, the improved 688s. Uh, I think the Navy's thinking is that not every attack submarine needs to be under ice capable. Some fraction of the fleet needs to be, and the Navy manages that over time by incorporating ice hardening into some of its attack submarines as needed to replace the ice hardened submarines that are retiring due to age. Thank you. And in my remaining 40 seconds, Emma Ruffhead, uh, while you were CNO, we made significant investments in the X-47 Bravo prototypes that could serve as unmanned combat area, aerial vehicles. Now we seem to be limiting unmanned aircraft in the carrier air wing to a tanker role. Why do you think that is? Um, I think it's a mistake. Uh, I really do believe that we need to be able to strike deeply unmanned off of an aircraft carrier. Um, earlier, I mentioned the fact that we've lost eight years in that process, um, and I think that we need to try to regain that ground because being able to go unmanned at, that, at a great distance to be able to replenish an air wing at great distance with unmanned vehicles is something that is going to transform the nature of naval aviation. I agree, and I'm out of time, so I won't make a comment about how you dated yourself with the previous frigate comments, which I very much appreciated. So I yield back, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Gallagher does that to all of us. So um, is uh, Mr. Vela still with us? I guess uh, we lost him here. So, um, so we do, if it's okay with the witnesses, have some members, I think, who would like to do a, a second round. Um, I'm going to reserve. I have one question. Uh, uh, Mike Conaway, I think, was, uh, in terms of the first order, you were first on the uh, batting order. I don't know if you have another question that you wanted to ask. No, no, no question. Just uh, thank the witnesses for being here today. And I do think that uh, all three of them would do the nation a great service if they could reflect on their thoughts uh, relative to the $3 trillion we've committed to spend in the last uh, three months and what impact that will have on our capacity to, to actually execute all the great things that they talked about. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thanks, Mike. Um, I don't know if that was a, a you know just a editorial comment or a question, but if, if anyone does want to uh, weigh in on on that, uh, you know, we've got some I, time. Um, Mr. Conway, I, I can't even begin to underestimate the challenge that uh, that this poses for the country, um, and the the burden that it will be on on all of us, and particularly on you, uh, as you have to make the hard decisions. But I, I do believe that being able to provide a viable Navy forward is important. I would also, as we look at how do we stimulate and bring the economy back, that we should look at opportunities to address um, the industrial base, uh, to address um, uh, education systems that give our young people skills that can, that can go into that. I also alluded to the fact that now is the time to perhaps jump on some opportunities that may be there, particularly in sea lift. Um, the, the prices are going to be extraordinarily good uh, for recapitalization of that fleet. Might not last very long, so I think it's important to do that. Those are just some thoughts. Uh, and, and I would also add that, that this is one of the uh, one of the drivers behind having a fleet that's more affordable is going to be the potential concern about uh, budget pressures coming from uh, the amount of debt that we've been incurring to support the current response to the coronavirus. So that that's one of the drivers behind the fleet architecture that we proposed in our written statement. Uh, very quickly, I actually touched on this point a little bit uh, in my uh, prepared statement. Um, 
I noted the fact that there are some people who are arguing that the expenditures that we have made to support the economy during the stay-at-home period uh, could have the effect of uh, putting further constraints on the defense budget in coming years because of the uh, impact on the deficit and the debt situation. Uh, but I pointed out that even if defense spending as a whole uh, is suppressed, that does not necessarily mean that that would carry through to the budget of the Navy. Uh, if we are going to adopt a less expensive concept for our national strategy and our role in the world, if we are going to stand off Eurasia, as some people are advocating, that can actually require a Navy as capable as the one we have today because you would, under even that more retrenched strategy, uh, depend as much or more than we do now on using the oceans as a buffer for protecting the United States from security challenges that might arise within Asia. Uh, and I did find it interesting that one uh, policy group here in Washington, just within the last few days, they happened to advocate a smaller defense budget, but they went out of their way to say that within that smaller defense budget, they think that the Navy should get a larger share of that budget because it's a key service for implementing that kind of a national strategy should policymakers decide that they want to go in that direction. So even if the defense budget goes down, the point is it does not necessarily imply or mean uh, that the Navy budget would go down with it. What it implies is a need to make choices about what your strategy is and how to implement it. Right. Well, thank you um, to all the witnesses for those answers. And again, Mr. O'Rourke, again, your testimony, I did read that section that you just cited, and it's, um, again, really a great thought provoker for all of us. So thank you for, uh, for mentioning that. So um, next up, uh, Jared, uh, you, uh, again, are on the batting order. If you have a question you want to uh, offer to the witnesses. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you uh, for the opportunity, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to follow up a little bit on my previous uh, question, as well as uh, Congressman Gallagher was talking about the frigate class. And um, with my first question, I talked with Admiral Roughhead about uh, the future of the DDG Flight 3's role in the Navy today. Uh, some people have testified a little bit in your um, uh, statements for the record uh, about the potential for a Flight 4 or talked briefly about the uh, potential for the future of our surface combatant. Uh, Mr. Clark, in, in your prepared remarks, you talked a little bit, and, and also just talking with Gallagher, you talked a little bit about how the frigate uh, should play like a, a lead role in anti-submarine warfare or escort service action groups. Uh, I think you also talk a little bit uh, in your prepared statement or in, in um, one of your reports about a smaller uh, surface combatant like a Corvette class or something. I just wanted to uh, give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about what you were envisioning for the future of the fleet uh, force when, when you were talking about that. Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, the uh, We recently did a study looking at the future of the surface fleet, and we saw the need to rebalance it uh, more than the Navy is already pursuing. So the frigate is a great step in the right direction at, to provide an alternative to a destroyer that essentially provides the same capability as a destroyer, but with a smaller capacity. And in ASW, it actually provides some additional capabilities. So we see that need to rebalance away from the destroyer as the only surface platform to add the frigate to the LCS. And then we also saw a need to further distribute the fleet by adding this Corvette. The challenge with the frigate is that Although it's smaller and less expensive than the destroyer, it's still uh, you know, a billion dollar ship or so, and it's gonna limit how many you're able to buy uh, and deploy and, and maintain in the field. It also has an operation and support cost associated with it that will constrain how much you can use them as an element of the fleet. So we needed a, another platform that was even less expensive to build and to maintain that could act as a uh, distributed source of fires and that could act as a security pl cooperation platform in peacetime. And we saw that Corvette as being a way to do that. So the Corvette would be uh, maybe 3,000 ton vessel that would be an alternative to the Navy's proposed large unmanned surface vessel. And it would carry vertical launch system and missiles so that it could provide fires and perhaps rotate through surface action groups as an element to do that. Uh, and then it could also act as a, uh, a counter piracy platform, maritime security platform, and do training and operations with our allies and partners overseas. So that, that rebalancing of the surface fleet to a more diverse set of platforms was really important to manage costs, but also to provide a fleet 
fleet that's maybe better suited for the environment that we're embarking on, where we're going to have this range of gray zones through uh, great power, high-end competition, where we need a, a more diverse set of platforms to support that. Uh, we saw the destroyers being a key element of providing missile defense both to uh, larger force, force formations like carrier strike groups and amphibious ready groups, as well as places ashore that require ballistic missile defense that can be relocated, and that's something they do today. So we saw the DDG's role as evolving as well in that future surface fleet. Um, thank you for that, and uh, uh, I just want to give you the opportunity. I had read that. I thought it was in, uh, interesting, uh, and I appreciate the testimony. Great. Um, thank you, Jared. Uh, so next up is Mr. Gallagher, followed by Ms. Loria. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. O'Rourke, to go back to your, your comment about budgetary constraints, I mean, are you suggesting uh, I mean, that we need, to be, we need to be having the broader conversation about the, uh, uh, the, the, the size of the budget that sea power consumes relative to land power and air power, particularly if we have, as I believe we do, a national defense strategy that prioritizes sea power in Indo-PACOM? That is always a question that the Congress or policymakers in general can consider. And questions like that and others, I think, are certainly going to be on the table as we move into whatever the world is going to look like after we get past the current pandemic situation. There are a lot of uh, uncertainties about what the pandemic may do to change the uh, international security environment going forward. Uh, and that particular question is one among several uh, that can be considered as we uh, examine what our national strategy should be and our military strategy within it. And then one follow up on the, the ice hardening conversation as we look at the retirement of our Los Angeles class subs over the next decade, with the exception of the five to seven boats, I think we're looking to refuel again. It appears as though we're gonna lose a lot of the ice hardened subs. So is there any conversation about a, a new ice hardened variant of the Virginia class? And I apologize if, I, if you commented before and I missed it. Uh, I haven't heard of it, but I would suspect that the, uh, within the Navy, they are very aware uh, of that factor. And my presumption would be that they are planning on uh, continuing that capability through modifications to the Virginia class uh, uh, that would be procured in coming years. Uh, and, and as we discussed earlier, I think it's important that we begin to think about the Arctic because Russia will be there, China will be there. Uh, so how do we want to do it? And, and I would be surprised if the Navy wasn't thinking about that. But uh, further to Ron's uh, point, I, I really do think, and I know this is a very hard inside the building, uh, inside the Pentagon and also up here, but the one-third, one-third, one-third is really something that needs to be addressed. And by that, I mean equal shares to the services. Uh, and I know that opens up parochial uh, fissures and fights. But um, where does the country want to be? What are the types of capabilities? And the budget needs to uh, um, su support that. And I completely agree, Admiral Ruffhead. I mean, you know, I say I confess my navalist bias and my sea power bias, but... Uh, it 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 it, it makes no geopolitical sense that you know the allocation of resource would fall neatly in a one third one third one third bucket. Um, so I think it has to be informed by strategy, and I really appreciate those comments. I want to ask one last question. I'm sorry, I don't uh, I want to go on here in my second round, but uh, Mr. Clark, there's been some conversation about perhaps a new carrier design to replace the Ford class. Given that our air wings are now around 65 aircraft, could we go to a smaller carrier? Uh, in theory, we could, but we've done a lot of analysis on this in support of this work that we've been doing in concert with the Navy and with uh, OSD. Uh, and the challenges we found is that the non-recurring engineering cost associated with building a new smaller carrier ends up eating up most of the cost savings that we would uh, harvest as a result of going to that smaller carrier. Uh, and so we found that really we might as well stick with the Ford class that gives us the the you know, the capacity and the uh, sortie generation capability and the new technologies that have already been incorporated into it. All those are, are good things. And, and once we've kind of come through the maturation of them uh, in this very long and painful process, we should 
stay the course on that because we found that shifting ended up being more problematic than staying on the current design. Uh, what we did see instead was a value in using the uh, large deck amphibious ship or the amphibious assault ships primarily as fixed wing carriers. So transitioning them from being kind of a multi-purpose amphibious ship to using them almost exclusively to do fixed wing F-35B deployments. And that would give you that smaller carrier that is able to do uh, operations in environments where they don't need the kind of sorties that a larger carrier would provide. And, and the Navy and the Marine Corps are already doing that a little bit to, today in the Middle East. Often that, that's the only uh, air air, sea-based airplanes are coming from an LHA or LHD. So taking that concept into the future and using the F-35 Bravo to its fullest extent would be a way to get you that smaller carrier. Well, didn't the Navy announce the cancellation of its future carrier study? If so, why? I mean, why not? I know the debate gets very fraught politically and in Congress, but why, why not have the debate? I mean, it may be just a matter of, uh, you know, internal dynamics within the Navy that caused that, that, that effort to fall apart because of leadership changes. Uh, but I do think there's, there's a lot of value in going back and continuing to evaluate what the right design for carriers is going forward, because at some point we will want to transition, you know, away from the Ford class. And then that transition probably should be uh, looking at a smaller carrier uh, if we're going to make that non-recurring engineering cost uh, investment anyway. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. This was very helpful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, next up is uh, Ms. Luria. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to, to go into the second round. And I wanted to follow up on the theme that Mr. Golden uh, was uh, speaking about uh, with Mr. Clark's response about the smaller ships. But um, I wanted to switch over to, to Mr. O'Rourke, because I know in reading your testimony, um, you commented on this. And I think I'm quoting you. Um, it may have been one of the other testimonies. The FFG is one third of the firepower, but two thirds of the cost. Um, and I saw that you had made some suggestions um, as to ways to, to build more platforms at the lower end. So if we're talking large surface combatants, small, we really want to talk small, small, um, and some of the ideas and specifically coordination with the Coast Guard and how we could leverage off of the designs that they've already implemented um, as naval forces. Um, can you comment on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the quote that you had is uh, from Brian Clark's testimony. Um, but the general mm -hmm. point is, is that uh, the frigate that we have uh, uh, in the FSGX is um, a 7,000 ton ship. Uh, and I'll say just very quickly uh, in answer to the earlier question that, about lessons learned from the LCS. The LCS was a new hull design and some new equipment. Uh, the frigate is uh, working off a parent design and it's not to have any new development items on it. So in terms of managing its technical risk, we seem to have learned a lot of lessons from the LCS. Now, as a frigate, it is a fairly large frigate by world standards. It's in the 7,000 ton range. And in my testimony, I talk about that creating room or opportunity to consider a smaller ships underneath it, something perhaps in the manner of a 5,000 ton ship, uh, which would be a smaller frigate, or something in the one the 4,000 ton range, which would be a corvette of the kind uh, that Brian Clark talked about. There are many possible ship designs out there for doing that, including designs that have come out of the Coast Guard's uh, cutter procurement program, including the National Security Cutter and the designs that have been developed for the offshore patrol cutter. That creates a once in a generation opportunity to think about. Um, commonalities that work across the services to get greater production economies of scale so that you could work more toward the goal of optimizing our national shipbuilding effort as opposed to sub-optimizing our shipbuilding effort at the individual service level. Well, thank you. And, and Mr. Clark, I wanted to go back to some comments in the 2017 CSBA um, Restoring America sea, American Sea Power Study. Um, I noted in there that you talked about the model that you were using with geographic combatant commanders and shifting that to a deterrence and maneuver model. And although we say we have global force management to force to, to source our forces around the world, um, often that creates geographic stovepiping of resources. And there is sharing, and the combatant commanders do work together. Um, but can you describe your model and, and specifically in the terms of how you think that could help us gain more efficiency um, in providing presence? Uh, yeah, so the model we, we moved to is similar to what was uh, adopted in the National Defense Strategy after that. So the model where you have forces that are focused on local operations overseas and different theaters. So there's a deterrence force for the East China Sea, and there's one for the South China Sea, and there's one for the uh, Persian Gulf. And it seemed to, to, to not sorry to interrupt, yeah. but that you had a lot of forward basing of these right, forces. Right, right. And those model. forces would predominantly be forward based. 
uh, where they would be able to you know, get used to the neighborhood, learn the allies, learn the potential adversaries, understand the geography. So we saw there being a lot of value in that model, which has been very beneficial for our uh, forward deployed naval force that's in Japan, where those forces gain that level of familiarity. And it also allows them to pursue this higher operational tempo or this shorter operational cycle because they don't need to relearn everything every time they go on deployment because they know where they're going and they know the people they're likely to deal with. Um, so those deterrence forces were then uh, augmented or complemented by a blunt force, which is the carrier strike groups that would be deploying out of the continental United States, that would be going on these longer deployments, that would be uh, operating on a slower, more uh, like the OFRP operational cycle. Uh, we saw it be really important to look at the, the divergence between two op different operational cycles because we saw it being uh, necessary to maintain presence overseas, to get a higher operational tempo out of some of our forces. And we saw the way to do that as uh, giving them this limited responsibility as a deterrence force where they didn't have to go through as long a training cycle for each deployment. And uh, because they would be remote and located near the areas where they were going to deploy, the transit time would be shorter. And so they could, they could maintain a higher operational tempo and therefore a greater presence. So that model was incorporated to some degree into the NDS um, in, in the form of the blunt force that the, uh, the, uh, the, the the blunt and contact forces that the International Defense Strategy discusses. Uh, the contact force is like our deterrence force, forward, largely forward deployed, operating in concert with our allies and, and dealing with adversaries. And then the blunt force was this larger force that remained offshore and operated from CONUS for the most part. If I could just add to that, um, I, I think the, the, the concept works well, but it also requires political flexibility because um, building ships, and having them forward where they're not being maintained uh, in the continental United States, where the economies aren't benefiting from the crews, um, that, that's political reality. And, and if we want to be able to be more flexible, if we want to be able to have these forward forces, that's something that uh, I think needs to be addressed. Well, thank you, Admiral. And I just wanna close by quoting something that Mr. Clark just said in his testimony. Um, when uh, answering a previous question. Um, I'm quoting you that you said, the, the resulting lack of, um, of a product or response from the Pentagon was based off of internal dynamics of leadership changes. And I think that we are caught up in exactly that churn right now because we don't have a 30 year ship building plan. We don't have a force structure assessment and the Navy has needs. We're here to meet those needs but if you can't tell us what they are because of the internal dynamics of leadership changes that continue to happen, it puts us in a difficult situation. And I think it puts the sailor on the deck plate in a difficult situation because I truly feel like there's not a consistent vision. And even when we have had a 30 year shipbuilding plan, when it changes every year in years one through five, um, that is still not a clear vision. So I appreciate your work. I appreciate the thought and insight you put into how we can develop our future Navy. Um, and I look forward to hearing from the Navy um, what they truly want to request um, to meet their mission. So thank you again. Thank you. Well, well put, uh, Elaine. Uh, next up again, Mr. Uh, Whitman uh, has a couple questions. I have one and then we'll, we'll uh, <laughs> call, it, call it a day. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I wanted to um, ask for our witnesses' perspective on our maritime forces interoperability. As you know, the Chinese are much better than we are by taking everything across the spectrum of their maritime uh, capabilities. And we've seen that, uh, what's happened uh, there in response to the Taiwanese, to the Japanese in certain disputed areas where the distinction between one force and another is, is not uh, significant. They are amassing their naval forces or their maritime forces. What I see in the United States is we have the United States Navy, we have the United States Marine Corps, we have the Merchant Marine, we have the Coast Guard. Obviously all have mission um, areas that are unique, but also do not operate in an in a interoperable way. And I would argue that there are many opportunities where they should. Uh, and if they don't, and the Chinese do, in those sort of gray zone areas where the Chinese have become very, very effective in doing that. And we are looking at the challenge of amassing enough maritime forces to deter and to operate in a, in a conflict. Then it seems like to me, we ought to be using every single element of maritime force structure in the United States 
Doesn't seem like we have that. Doesn't seem like we even have a plan going forward. So I wanted to get your perspective on what should be the path forward for all of those elements of maritime forces in the United States to have a formal plan of interoperability, much like we have with other forces around the world. You know, we jointly operate elsewhere. We do, we do RIMPAC. Um, you know, why don't we have the same sort of operational exercise with all U.S. maritime forces, which we never do? So anyway, I want, want, want to get your perspective there. Uh, for fear of sounding like a dinosaur, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I think that um, we, we have focused on the joint force, and there's no question, you know, in my lifetime, I've seen us become a much more effective military mm -hmm. because of jointness. But I think the one thing that we seem to have neglected is to acknowledge the fact that the maritime space is, is different. Yes. And to your point, within the maritime domain, it, it almost is a joint force unto itself. Right. And, um, and I really do think, and, and I was part of the National Defense Strategy Commission, mm -hmm. and we were very blunt about the fact that there were not operating concepts about how we would move forward, how we would engage. Um, there were piecemeal parts. Mm -hmm. So um, I really do think that you know, the, the uh, maritime strategy that was developed for a different time during the Reagan administration for a different adversary, but very uh, high-end warfare, uh, is something that needs to be done today. And I don't think we should be shy about the fact that it is maritime, yeah. that it is about our maritime forces uh, that require certain types of capabilities to come together, that we can rely on elements of the joint force, but we really need to start thinking more about the maritime domain because I would argue uh, that the, the PLA, if you look at their writings, they have transitioned and a lot of their work is into a maritime space. Yeah. And, uh, and I think if we do not acknowledge the fact that we have maritime needs, capabilities, and we have to integrate all of it, we're going to be behind the eight ball. Uh, certainly, and uh, you look at the Chinese case, and they've got uh, the People's uh, Maritime Militia, the PLA Navy, uh, and then they've got uh, the Coast Guard, all operating under a single command organization. That's something we need to look at. That certainly, uh, in the Pacific Fleet, that's happening today. So we're now starting to deploy Coast Guard cutters regularly to mm -hmm. the Pacific. They're operating under the uh, command of Pacific com into Pacific Command and PAC Fleet. That's the, that we need to do more of that. Yes. Um, that was, we're going to require maybe some force design changes in the Coast Guard. So we've got more forces that are able to deploy overseas and act in that manner mm -hmm. because we are the away team. You know, so the, the home field advantage afforded to the Chinese gives them the ability to have all these different units occupy the, the South and East China Seas. Mm -hmm. So having a command structure that's organized around you know, having all these elements uh, under their, their uh, leadership, uh, having more of these forces that can deploy overseas. And I think you bring up a great point with the Merchant Marine is uh, we do have CLF forces and CLF forces deployed over in the uh, Pacific that could do more to contribute to our operations. And so uh, as, we maneuver, as we move towards a more distributed logistics force, it's going to be able to contribute more directly to the capability of the forces that are deployed. And they could do more than simply just you know, bringing material back and forth. They could do some more of the surveillance mission. They could do more of the uh, response mission when there's you know, a, 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 a boater that needs assistance or a piracy attack on somebody. So there's areas where we may look at more unified operations between the Merchant Marine, Coast Guard, and uh, the Naval Forces out there. But it requires these force design changes and it requires that unified command uh, structure. Yeah, very good. Uh, very quickly, you mentioned interoperability in the Pacific. And if we're considering that on an allied basis, then I think the, the first country to talk about and, and uh, the most significant one is going to be Japan because they have the largest of the allied uh, navies in that part of the world. And um, in terms of interoperability, uh, if you talk to um, Navy personnel out there, one of the points they'll make is that it would help if Japan's own forces became more joint than they are because their Navy and their Air Force don't work as closely together with one another as we are used to our own Navy and Air Force in the U.S. context. So that would be one thing where you could get more bang for the buck just with the forces that you have. Yeah. Secondly, it would then be a matter of having uh, the Japanese forces, the Navy, and also their Air Force work with greater interoperability with us. Several years ago, our fleet 
uh, may have told you that that was at a certain level and that there was a lot of room for improvement. My understanding is that there has been some improvement and that our interoperability with the Japanese forces is better. Finally, in terms of making use of all the available force structure that is out there, I have tried to scour the world for unrealized Western naval force structure, and the number one opportunity that I have identified is the Japanese attack submarine force. For industrial base purposes, they build one per year so that they have a steady drumbeat. So the size of their force depends on how long they keep them in service. Mm -hmm. They keep their, sur their submarines in service for 22 years because they have a force level goal of 22 submarines. But if they were to simply make a decision to keep their submarines in service for 30 years, more like our own service, they could grow their submarine force from 22 to 30 without building a single boat more than what they already mm -hmm. plan to build. Mm -hmm. yeah. And furthermore, if they were to grow that force from 22 to 30, it would grow from that number at the very same time frame that we are going down to the bottom of the valley. Mm -hmm. They would hit 30 within a year of when we are at the minimum of our own attack submarine valley. Now, those are diesel boats, and they can't do as much as a nuclear boat, mm -hmm. but they can do some things. Yes. So if we're talking about interoperability and trying to make use of available force structure, this is one option. And it's something that I've talked about with our Navy and with the Japanese Ministry of Defense as well. And so I'm watching to see whether they will pull the trigger on that. Because right now, they can expand their submarine force without building any more boats than they already plan to. I think if I could just add yes. to that, I, I think Ron hit on a, on a terrific point. Um, you know, we talk about our allies, and we have a pretty exclusive club with, with what's called the Five Eyes, and, mm -hmm. and there are certain things that we do with them. But I really do believe that it's time that we change the nature of our alliance with Japan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan has some things that they need to do to, uh, to accommodate that, mm -hmm. but I really do think that that has to be a, a, an elevation because, as Ron said, they have really good stuff, yeah. and they're very, very proficient operators. Um, the recent changes in their, in their interpretation of laws have made that change dramatic, yeah. and I think that we have to think differently about Japan. No, I think that's a great point, that mill-to-mill -mill relationship should be uh, turned up a notch on the, on the effort uh, to make sure we have capability to bridge that gap. Interoperability, as you said, is not just you know, within the United States military or within our maritime forces. It's also with our allies. And I do want to emphasize that you know, there are parts of interoperability within our maritime forces. The problem is it's fragmented, and normally it's... Marine Corps to Navy, and then Navy to Coast Guard, instead of Coast Guard to Marine Corps, and, and interoperability in all four of those, Merchant Marine included. So we have pieces of that. The key is, is how do you fully integrate all of that? I think there's a tremendous amount of capability there that we can bring to bear, both on deterrence and on being able to operate in contested environments, I think, too. And then, you know, the big thing in those environments is how do you create more uncertainty? And as our allies look at this and say, wow, I, we, didn't, we didn't see this type of interoperability, and then exercising that. So, uh, so our, our, our adversaries look at it and go, well, we're not quite sure what uh, the Marine Corps can do in conjunction with the Coast Guard or you know, what support elements are brought by the Merchant Marine. Those things are going to be critical, especially in times of limited resources. So use what we've got. Ron, you bring up great points about getting our allies to bring uh, into, into service a greater period of time availability for those submarines, all, all great uh, aspects. So, Mr. Chairman, with that, I, I yield back. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Whitman, and uh, great, great comments. Um, so, uh, you know, I just was wanted to close out maybe uh, with Mr. Clark just for a minute um, to go back to where we sort of began the conversation a couple of hours ago, which is, and Elaine described it, I think, aptly, is just that, you know, we're, we're on the brink of making, you know, a, a big decision in terms of a markup, um, and we're going to be investing money. But uh, in my 14 years here, I just have never been in a situation where it, it's just, you know, kind of this radio silence in terms of what is the normal operating pr procedure. I don't know whether, uh, Mr. Clark, you had any sort of thoughts about what you see happening in the Navy and the Secretary of Defense Office that is sort of holding up the, the show. Again, Mr. O'Rourke's report kind of in excruciating detail, you know, talked about some of the leaks and the, and the you know, uh, press reports about, you know, whether it's going to be, you know, this number or that number. Um, you know, why, why don't we have a plan? And what, what do you, what's your observation as someone who's pretty, 
you know, savvy guy who's been around in this in this town. Uh, well, so what I uh, see right now is uh, we've got the, the Navy is uh, has a plan that maybe wasn't adequately addressing some of the concerns of the Secretary of Defense's staff regarding cost, uh, and then maybe an evolution of the fleet towards a new design. So maybe less con more conservative than what the SecDef staff might have been looking for. Uh, the less con the more conservative approach towards changing the fleet also means that it might cost more, and that there's a co cost concern there. So reconciling those differences is what this current study is trying to do: is uh, evaluating what that fleet design should look like to try to deal with cost constraints that are likely to be in place, while also evolving the fleet to create the capabilities we're talking about here, incorporate new technologies, you know, create more uncertainty for adversaries, start to make the fleet a little bit more uh, distributed uh, compared to where it is today, uh, but do so with a, in a realistic way that doesn't damage the industrial base. So squaring all those different considerations is what the, this current study is trying to do, and our, our con contribution to it was attempting to do as well. I don't anticipate we're going to get results out of that until basically the lead up until the, the program budget review, which will happen this fall. So th this summer will be the time when a lot of this reconciliation occurs. Some final answers might come out around the time that that ends. And then going into program budget review for the FY22 budget will be when some decisions are made about what the Navy's shipbuilding plan and force structure assessment is going to look like. And so we may not see those answers until that time frame, which will make it difficult for the Congress to decide on how to mark up the bills. Uh, I think in terms of what the, the budget's going to look or that the force structure assessment will look like is it'll look very similar to kind of what the you know, previous plan looked like. So we're not going to have a dramatic change. We're not going to get rid of classes of ships, for example, and start new ones from scratch. But there is going to be this in need for investment in the new platforms that we need to distribute the fleet to complement the platforms we already have. So we're going to continue building DEG-51s and, and Virginia-class submarines and Columbia-class will continue and, and amphibious fleet will continue. Uh, LPD production, uh, Flight 2 will continue and the LHA-9 will still come. But we need to think about investing in the R&D necessary to start those new set of platforms, and that's maybe something where the Congress can start to lay that seed corn in because the, the Navy's going to need that to start rebalancing the fleet for the future. Um, I think an important element of it also will be to ensure that the current classes that are in production are sustained uh, and give that demand signal to industry because otherwise you're going to have industry starting to hold back its potential capital investment in, out of concern that we're throwing away classes of ships and betting on the come. And I, I, the Navy, I don't think, is going to do that. I don't think that's what the Secretary of Defense's intent is either, to throw away the existing capability and bet on the new one. Um, so we'll have to do both for a while. So making those investments will be important, I think, and that's what the markup may need to entail. Well, I appreciate that. I, uh, I mean, it's an explanation. It's, in my opinion, not a justification. Right. <laughs> uh, just, uh, you know, having this sort of blackout is, um, you know, given all of the... Um, I wouldn't say, you know, well, yeah, urgency that we heard from, you know, members and as well as the right. witnesses here today. Um, again, it's just, um, as I said, something that we I've never experienced on the subcommittee during my time. And um, uh, But your testimony today was extremely helpful in terms of providing, you know, I think great guidance, both, you know, long-term, short-term. Um, again, just can't thank all of you enough for, um, you know, being here today and uh, your patience answering two rounds uh, of questions. Um, again, kudos to the staff for, uh, you know, really bringing this all together in an, you know, unprecedented fashion. And, um, and again, I think uh, we, we certainly checked the box in terms of the Rules Committee's requirements uh, today, but in more importantly, I think uh, the content of the hearing is going to give us uh, uh, the right guidance so that we move forward with a, ver a strong mark. So again, thank you to all the witnesses. And with that, uh, I will adjourn the hearing.